This is your home for St. Cloud State Hockey, keeping you up to date on the NCHC. One-timer coming, they score! Ripped in! A bomb from Perrix! Women's WCHA. So Dana Rasmussen fires and she scores! Dana Rasmussen for the Huskies. The National Hockey League. Dwayne Kaprizov in for a chance to win it! He scores! And everything from the state of hockey. St. Cloud Cathedral is now 42.6 seconds away from wrapping up the school's first ever title. Welcome to the Huskies Warming House Podcast Den. The Huskies Warming House podcast is also brought to you by the Soda Pod, home of MNCAA college hockey news and more. Stay wild and up to date with new episodes throughout every week. Find them on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and other podcast platforms. Welcome into the Huskies Warming House podcast, episode 207 here in the Den. Nate Maxson alongside Noah Grant for the last time here in the Den and the Huskies Warming House podcast. Kind of a wild thing to say. Um, we have a lot to cover in this show and a lot of really amazing things that we're going to encapsulate here in what is our final episode, at least for recording, a small little tidbit and maybe a treat coming for fans here. Before the end, even though we said this is the end, uh, we, we, we do this all the time, don't we? We say we're going to do something and then we do something else. But as far as us... We? You mean you do? Well, true. But... Uh, I, I gave Nick the idea and he agreed. So, I mean, uh, what more can you say? Uh, but yes, a lot of agreement over four and a half years. You know, a really great show that we've put together. At least we thought so. I don't know how others perceive it, but uh, a, a fantastic time. I, I think a lot of stuff that we're going to go through here tonight, uh, we're recording this show on Tuesday, April 16th, hopefully going to come out in the early morning on Wednesday, the 17th, uh, you know, depending on how much editing has to go into this one, a little bit more than most, of course, for our last show. But this is the last time that Nick and I will be recording a show together here in episode 207 and a lot of really great things to talk about. Uh, we will touch on a bit of couple current events uh, before we you know get into the, the nitty-gritty of things as well as our special guest uh, we'll talk uh, briefly about of course the national championship game that happened last week as well to finish out the college hockey season maybe spend about two or three minutes on Arizona we covered them enough that maybe we should have just at least glance at that for like two minutes because w- yep. WTF uh, briefly briefly kind of encapsulate the men's and women's hockey seasons and kind of our overall perception of that uh, and then a really great interview we got to sit down with the final guest in Huskies Warming House podcast history, head coach of the men's hockey team, Brad Larson. That'll be about 40, 45 minutes that we'll go through that. And then the final hour of the show is going to be all things Huskies Warming House podcast and kind of jumping down memory lane, taking a look at some statistics, some early show things, and uh, a lot of really fun stuff. Probably no timestamps. If you're on the YouTube channel, if you're going through the show notes, I might try to update timestamps as I go through. It might not happen initially on Wednesday, but I think I'm going to try to go through and do that and update as best as I can. So it is going to take some time, but we appreciate it as always. And Nick, for the last time in show history, without further ado, Center Ice View News and Notes presented by HuskiesIllustrated.com and The Soda Pod. Center Ice View News and Notes. Center Ice View provides you with the best coverage of St. Cloud State Huskies hockey from game notes, recaps, photos, and more. Go to centericeview.com. Episode 207 here in the den. Nick Maxson alongside Noah Grant. And Nick, uh, before we cap off the college hockey world i guess the big story coming out that uh will be i guess our last nhl topic on show history as well too only fitting um as things are moving on yeah apparently the arizona coyotes technically not technically maybe not maybe this was weird Mm, is it really though yeah i think in the capacity that it happened it was very much uh uh, for those who missed it that the rumor official slash not confirmed but not it, very odd. Uh, essentially, Arizona Coyotes management telling their players that the move to Utah and Salt Lake City is 
done. Fairly likely and imminent, yeah. Um, which is weird. They told him on a Friday morning before they were in Edmonton, getting ready to play in Edmonton, which is the most Arizona Coyotes thing ever. But I, I think just in the manner of where we've sat here for speculation, the NHL has pushed things off, said we're confident they're going to figure this out, and suddenly it's, oh, by the way, we haven't figured it out, and oh, by the way, we're moving, and oh, but it's not actually confirmed, but oh, by the way, it sucks if you're a Coyotes fan. Good luck. Like, yeah. Um, so <laughs> let's let's backtrack, Noah, because um, I don't want to say I called it, but I kind of did. So when the 10B vote failed, there was someone on this podcast, myself being <laughs> that guy, that said that the Coyotes had 90 days to put a plan together. Now, I am hesitant to give the Coyotes any credit here because... They apparently have been at least a public story is that they were working on this land trust deal just about a month later. Yeah, until they realized it was too expensive. (laughs) I don't know if it's too expensive. I just think that there's still too much uncertainty around it. Mm -hmm. And I do think that at that point when the Tempe boat failed, I think the NHL realized that something's amiss, right? Now, I don't think we got to where we are today, Noah, because of the failed Tempe vote. I do think Marty Walsh so of the NHLPA really got this going, right? Um, even in the first year at Mold Arena, and I'll try to be as concise as possible because I know we have a ton of ground to cover. Um, there have been reports from behind the scenes that, you know, that the locker rooms were basically made with makeshift curtains for the visiting team. Yeah. Um, it wasn't up to NHLPA standards nhl standards um like they thought it was going to be essentially and then marty walsh the new nhl pa who i really really like i'm going to say that right out front i think he's been a much more aggressive in terms of um getting on board certain issues and more so using the public domain as a way to communicate to the nhl i do think that that was part of it i also have sources that tell me noah that the nhl internally was also nervous as all hell about the possibility of the Coyotes potentially playing in a playoff series because they were close up until their 14-game losing streak um, right on the turn of the calendar year. You combine all that with this land trust year that's in no way, shape, or form guaranteed. And even if they do win that, um, I know that most folks have already up to speed on this, but there's still a ton of infrastructure work that has to be done. The city of Scottsdale mayor came out and absolutely blasted that plan, complaining that he didn't, he never was consulted and this would be a bad thing. Now, mind you, of course, a day later in all politics, he walked pretty much that entire stance back. Um, <laughs> but at the end of the day, I do think the NHL understood that they were in a situation where they could not continue to play at Mullet Arena, that the other board of governors, more than likely, and this I'm sure we'll hear more about later, also started to voice their opposition to, because again, it's, it's a hockey-related revenue situation in terms of shared um, you know, income for the league that was being affected by this. And I think ultimately the NHL just decided, you know what, this is this this can't continue. And I think up until more details about the land trust and how it was going to play out came through and then more opposition came through. I, I think this was really been worked on for a while as far as the relocation talks. And I think they tried to keep it quiet and then it got out. And then the coyotes, like most of things, they did not handle it very well publicly. Um, so the players have been told, as you mentioned, that was really from even the head coach, uh, um, Andre Turini, to essentially ask for it. GM flies up to Edmonton and informs the players of what we know is told that the move is happening. Again, this is not official. The Board of Governors would have to meet and sign off on this, which we all expect would happen. Um, it's just unfortunate that for the fan base, and I, and I think we're going to get into you know the fan base and everything else. I think that's irrelevant. Just the way this has been handled has been interesting and more so the details of a potential of five year exclusive window for Mirawella to make it happen again. I have my serious doubts on that on both sides of the equation, both for the NHL plus with Mirawello. Yeah, um, it's interesting and it sucks either way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, not paying hotel bills, doing the exact same thing they did when they were at Gila River Arena. I mean, it's just it, the, the trend continues and it's. Yep. It's unfortunate, but it maybe is time. Uh, I think the positive I thing do. that comes out of this is 
it seems like Utah has a plan. And furthermore, they're not across the country. They're still within the realm of where your divisional realignment isn't going to happen, where you need to worry about shuffling things around. Uh, if you're the NHL, it, it, it almost was a, a, an exit out the back door, so to speak, being it was. able to kind of escape a little bit this situation. And uh, yeah, kind of a wild finish to all of this, if it indeed you know is everything we're hearing, which we don't really have any indication that it's not going to be, um, which is yeah, wild. It, it's a done yeah. deal. Um, and yeah. plus, to add on to that, the city of Utah slash not the city, that's a that's a state, Nick. Um, <laughs> As you can see, we've learned a lot in the you know four and a half years, including with the differences between a state and a city. Um, but no, the state of Utah like have passed public money to help fund a new um, joint arena for the Jazz and the NHL. They are they're going to get off season upgrades to make it more suitable for hockey, while the construction would begin on their new home. Uh, again, Salt Lake is in the mix for the 2032 Winter Olympics, if I recall correctly. Um, so all this put together, Ryan Smith, um, from everything that I have read, from everything that's been reported, he's He's a great owner with deep pockets who um, is a little bit more forward thinking. The NHL loves that. And I think you put it perfectly. This was the perfect exit strategy from Arizona. And I think the way that the NHL is trying to portray it to the public is that this is merely we they're going to say we had to do it this way because of the limitations. Right. Um, I can almost speak for Batman just because it's just too predictable. Um, <laughs> and then with this five year negotiation window, Noah, let's not forget that. This land trust date on June 27th, it's still really important for this so-called five-year negotiating window because if you think about it, if they win it, and mind you, if he wins the sale, he's going to walk away with a billion dollars right from the sale right. uh, to the NHL. Um, he's going to have to develop the infrastructure around it. He's going to have to have a building built within five years, plus I would imagine some other uh, things on a checklist. So if the Coyotes are really going to be what they call reactivated, yeah. um, it still falls on winning the land trust deal on the 27th by the Marowellos and concurrently building the new arena slash practice facility they're on. So there's still a lot that could happen in the near future that will dictate, um, I think, not only the Coyotes future, but the NHL future in Arizona, which I know the NHL wants to be in. They love the market. They believe in it. They wouldn't have continued to be there for this long if they didn't. But I do wonder if Marowella can deliver on what um, he's been promising. Uh, so far, he has not. Yeah, just difficult. Uh, re really tough to talk about. And uh, yeah, hopefully the the most negativity we're going to have on this show about a topic. Although, uh, of course, we have to recap uh, a hockey season for the men's and women's team here on the St. Cloud side of things, both of which did not end in a national championship for either. And of course, speaking of national championships, let's talk about... Uh, the finish to the men's college hockey season and talking about uh, the Frozen Four, Denver winning their national championship. And hey, when have we heard that before? Very good, obviously. Uh, Just a couple uh, of years ago. <laughs> yeah, as a program, setting a couple of records, bada boom, bada bing. So uh, yeah, first game of the evening, uh, it was fantastic. Uh, Denver, Boston University, that 2-1 final. Uh, this was a great hockey game. Uh, it it was. Through and through. I mean, everything you could have wanted out of this contest contest uh yeah and then even you go into essentially you know the other game of the day bc for nothing over michigan really this was a one goal contest until a really unfortunate bounce from michigan and then all of a sudden a breakaway blows this game wide open uh the eagles get the job done i thought they were probably the better team but michigan had a couple of really good looks i think this score is a little misleading uh, as far as the pace of play that we saw in this hockey game. Uh, and then, of course, the national championship game. 2 nothing was the final. None of us are even remotely close on the total number of goals uh, combined nope. in this one. But 2-0, uh, uh, both goals scored in period number two. Great hockey game. How about uh, uh, Matt Davis standing on his head, by the way? Uh, 23 yep. shots on goal for BC compared to five in period number three. And that pushback for the Eagles to try to get back in didn't matter. Denver national championship and Nick, congratulations. I believe for the first time in show history, I, I'd have to, I'd have to look back. Not that anyone cares at this point, but uh, right. I, I believe that that is it for uh, your first win is. in the it bracket is. challenge. And uh, you pretty much smoked me. It ended up doing a very good job down the stretch. We talked about that so much as if you want to win a bracket challenge, yes, your first round is really important because you can snag a lot of points early, but you, your your front runners have to make it 
And as we kind of alluded to with Center SU on Twitter is uh, I did what I typically do where I went a little bit more kind of bold uh, in terms of trying to find the upsets and capitalize on them. You went a little more traditional in a bracket that had the potential to have a lot of upsets. Did. Really didn't. And uh, you stuck with your guns and followed all the way through. So congrats on that. Uh, also, just overall national championship, the last one we'll cover in show history. What did you think about the final Frozen Four in St. Paul? Oh, goodness. It was good hockey. How was. Um, like you mentioned, really good hockey. Um, it, it's the first Frozen Four in a while, Noah, where you can look at all three games and go, man, that was really good hockey. Yeah, and you, know? you look at a 4 nothing score and say that was a great hockey game still. It still was. Now, I will disagree on one thing because the Michigan goaltender looked really rough. Yeah. Uh, just watching him, I guess, from my seat again at the press box there doing some work for College Hockey West. Um, he looked very, very... And I know he's a young goaltender, so I don't mean this to to disrespect the the Michigan goaltender, but yeah, you know, his positioning wasn't very sound. He, he was very active in his crease. He would overcommit quite a bit. Um, the wraparound goal, he was almost two pad lengths off the interior post when Gabe Perot wrapped it around. So, um, but to your point, as you mentioned, yes, I mean the score still a little misleading. There was still a lot of back and forth. I feel like if Michigan had a little bit better defensive posture, it would yeah. have been on the scoreboard a little bit more close, but, uh, and then the national championship game, you know, after Denver goes two one, two one, two one again, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, at, at the end of it, you know, I, I said in a pregame little stand up I did with college hockey West, that my magic number was three. And that if it was under three goals, that's Denver's game. If it was over three, that's BC's. And unfortunately, 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 whichever you want to, uh, which side you're on, it was Denver, uh, Denver yeah. uh, had another kind of a slow start. They, they finally found their footing midway through the first, which was better than five minutes into the second in the first semifinal. Mm -hmm. Um, and BC, you could see the frustration building. They missed an open net, um, yep, early on, early yep. on. Um, and, uh, you, you know, that's going to hurt. And then again, Matt Davis, you know, you're down to nothing. The third, you're pushing hard. You get a great look on a setup. And then Dave, you know, Matt Davis just makes the save of the year. Um, unbelievable save the Superman save. And, uh, um, I mentioned this on, on X, but, uh, you know, that was about as equivalent to me as Denver scoring a third goal. Yeah. Absolutely. Really that deflating. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you talked about it, the very much a prototypical Denver game is just paying the playing that patient game and being able to kind of manage the emotional plane of a contest. You know, they got shelled in period number three, for lack of a better term. You knew that BC was going to come with their best effort of the season. I would say most other teams would have given up at least one and probably would have mm -hmm. conceded that game to head to overtime. I, I mean, just with the firepower that BC had, the push that they had, you know, two penalties in period number three for B or for Denver as well. Like, that's not an easy task to no. kind of commit to the defensive structure, which historically in general for hockey teams does not bode well for you in a hockey no. game. But it, ha and, but it happened. And, and Noah, to, I want to get your opinion on this, but I, I think BC pushed hard enough where, you know, you could see, uh, like we mentioned the frustration part, but I got the sense that if they saw one go in, it could be a much different storyline at the end of that hockey yeah. game. They were playing that well. Also, credit Denver. They are blocking shots left and right, too, in their own zone, especially in the third. So, yeah, 25 shots, I think you said, in the third. I think it could have been much higher than that because yeah. Denver really also did sell out in blocking shots. So, uh, it was BC's period. Uh, again, Matt Davis standing on his head and uh, Denver doing the best they can to help him out. Uh, you combine that and Denver walks away with, again, its 10th national championship the first program to get to double digits in that regard so pretty pretty amazing storyline david carl a national championship second time in three years as a 34 year old head coach by the way mm -hmm. um and this season he that's his third trophy right world junior uh, championship gold nchc frozen face-off championship and now an ncaa national championship that's it's a great season for a head coach in college hockey yeah, not too shabby if you're a Pios fan right now. And I mean, if you're an NCHC fan, you got to feel good about that, knowing that a team that actually had a fairly sluggish start to the first half of the season, you know, they got hot at the right time. We talked about it. They did pretty much the opposite of what St. Cloud, unfortunately, did on the men's side through down through much of the stretch. Uh, so congrats to the national champion Denver Pioneers. Our men's hockey team, 17, 16, and 5, they finished their season, did not qualify for the NCAA tournament uh, for the first time in show history, minus the COVID year when no 
nobody actually ended up playing. So a uh, bit of an unfortunate result. We'll sit down with Brett Larson and talk a little bit about that. He was very candid about the, his uh, perception of this men's hockey team this season and kind of where they were at. But, you know, Nick, uh, just very briefly, uh, this men's team, a little bit different than in years past, as we mentioned. Overall, uh, how did you see this season, though, as we encapsulated our final year of men's hockey here? So I, I think before the non-conference schedule, there was some question marks, right? Uh, Noah, especially with losing some uh, veterans on defense, uh, again, Coronel up front. Uh, there were some questions down the middle in terms of the Ford group. And let's just say that early on, the first four or five weeks, we were very troubled. I think that's the first way we could look at it, right? We get a week off in between the non-conference schedule and the conference schedule. Uh, we, I believe it was Miami, right, was the first series. Um, if I recall correctly, we took care of business. We said, okay, uh, we look better, but, you know, let's let's see how we do the rest of the way. They go 7-0-1 uh, for the first half of the season. And we sort of thought, okay, they're, they're better now. But also, we haven't seen Denver. We haven't seen North Dakota. Um, hmm. We we have still yet to wait and see with this team. And I think the second half, no, unfortunately, was very telling. It was very similar to some of the issues we saw with the non-conference schedule. And ultimately, you combine those two together, um, you get the result that it was. And I mean, still then, they still finished just one or two spots outside of the uh, of a position to go with the NCAA tournament, despite all the adversity. And uh, yeah, I, I think that's my best summation. What what were what were yours? Well, yeah, I think we kind of talked about it technically in a pairwise position. If you're not counting the auto bids, uh, you know, we call that a disappointing season. We touched on it with Brett a little bit. You'll hear about it. Is that you know that's a high bar that's been set over the past couple of years. But yeah, just not enough of the gear sinking up in motion here this year. Uh, and as you kind of mentioned, I think the holiday break couldn't have come at a worse time because they had some traction, they had some momentum. You start to give some of these teams too a second chance to kind of regroup during the holiday break, find some footing, get some rest, prepare for the second half of the season, which historically, at least in show history, has not been kind to the Huskies. You know, that January, February slog, and it was not a favorable NCHC schedule as well. You also think about, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, Duluth kind of had a down year, but they always play the Huskies tough. CC, what an incredible story they were this season. The fact they didn't make the tournament is a shame. Uh, Omaha, Great year for them, pushed uh, you know the Gophers potentially to the brink in that first game in the NCAAs as well. They're looking to kind of make that next step as well too. Uh, so you know you have seven teams. I would throw Duluth in there once they kind of find their footing again, um, but they're still kind of a tough out. Seven teams that are formidable in the NCHC and Miami gave a couple of groups fits, almost took North Dakota um, down in regulation a couple Fridays before the end of the regular season as well too. So. Um, Tough NCHC. We're starting to see that parity come out in that conference. Starting to see the skill level around college hockey in general be good. Of course, you know, this team had Michigan during the Thanksgiving holiday break, who ended up being the Frozen Four. You know, two goal hockey games against them. I mean, a couple of really high points in this season, but just not enough to find that extra level for this men's team to get the job done, unfortunately. But a great season. Always, always a blast to cover this men's hockey team, even though it was not the season that we were potentially hoping for but maybe one that we kind of expected with a lot of the turnover on the women's side a uh, bit of a frustrating second half for them but a really great stepping stone uh in, in that regard a uh, lot of turnover coming in the offseason but it was a great push to the finish for them ohio state the national champion won nothing getting their vindication over wisconsin in the final game of the year women's hockey for st cloud 17 17 and 2 on the season we thought they would get to 20 wins they weren't quite able to get there but still a really great showing a really great first half of the season especially as well too uh pretty much did everything but put the puck in the net that was their only achilles heel they just couldn't find that extra gear that extra offense uh i would say you know and losing that last spot in the ncaa field as well too with a bit of an upset late uh yeah tough to swallow that just kind of felt how the year was is it could have been so, so amazing, but it was like, you know, dangling the Twinkie in front of the fat kid, right? We so close and just not quite there, uh, but great season overall, just not the result you're looking for. And how weirdly parallel was the women's season compared to the men, yeah. right? When you had um, a great first half in, you know, for, for St. Cloud, you know, we're certainly not saying there were flaws in their game. I was calling almost every single home game the first, you know, for this whole season. Um, I think what was disappointing for the women's side was 
you know, it, it wasn't that they weren't creating or whatnot. They just couldn't finish. Um, and as that really killed them in the second half, um, you know, they were in a spot, they, they were ahead of Duluth in terms of point percentage. Uh, so they actually controlled home ice for the first half of the season. And uh, then you drop one, I believe, against St. Thomas, another one against Minnesota State, if I recall correctly. Um, you really you took the Gophers to overtime a couple of times. They couldn't pull out uh, the extra point there. So they had a lot of close games. But again, the second half uh, offense just not just dried up. I mean, it was, you know, uh, Death Valley. There was none to be there. And uh, like you said, no, it, it sort of cost them, I believe, in missing out by one spot. It cost them an NCAA tournament bid. And uh, now with a bunch of turnover happening this year, a lot of questions for Brian Idolsky. What, um, to your point, you talk about the stepping stone. This team, has, just like kind of Colorado College, they have made a transition in the way they play. Um, you know, they're not just a defensive frontal team that tries to, uh, you know, force a mistake and then transition the puck up north and capitalize. Um, they really were pushing back. You know, they were driving possession. They were creating. They were cycling. Um, you know, he talked about activating defense in terms of the uh, offensive side of the rush. Um, so it's a stepping stone regardless. Um, you know, I, I'm very curious as to how some of the freshmen that never played a game this year, that redshirted essentially, are going to fit in. Someone like a Grace Del Monico. Um, you know, you're, you're kind of concerned about um, some of the, the transfer portal, which I'm sure St. Cloud is going to yeah. be uh, probably heavily involved in. Uh, but Brian Adels continues to make his mark on this program. Um, so it, it's still the best finish they've had in a very, very long time. It's just unfortunate that with some of the stalwarts like a Clara Himmler Rover or maybe a Taylor Linder and Emma Gentry that unfortunately won't be around to maybe see some of the reward with that hard work, uh, but certainly have been part of the stepping stone to get the program to the next level. And, uh, you know, and although we won't be covering it on this show, Noah, I know that a lot of Huskies fans are going to be watching from uh, afar, uh, hopefully in a seat next season because this yeah. team is still has a, a lot of upside to it. And they had definitely have the right men at the helm for it. Yeah, absolutely. Would have loved to have had Brian Adelski on the show, but unfortunately wasn't able to make that happen. But uh, yeah, you mentioned transfer portal, by the way, Brett Larson giving us kind of a hint as to the transfer portal grouping that's going on right now. The Huskies in this past week got one of their guys that they were looking for, by the way. So uh, exciting additions coming for this men's hockey team uh, who looks to regroup. Men's team is done. Women's team is done. The Minnesota Wild will be done in a couple of days here as well, too. So hockey closing out here on the Huskies Warming House podcast. And we sat down with one of the head coaches of one of the teams, St. Cloud State's men's head coach, Brett Larson. And welcome into the Huskies Warming House podcast, final show here in the den and our final guest joining us none other than uh the guest that has the most appearances here on the huskies warming house podcast he head coach of the men's hockey team brett larson brett uh how you doing we're recording here on sunday april 7th so show coming out about a week later but uh how are things going in your neck of the woods uh they're going good this is uh it's a new season of the year that, that started <laughs> here with the new rules it's called transfer portal time and uh <laughs> Boy, you used to have a couple of weeks to uh, kind of relax a little bit after the year. Not now. It's uh, it's full go, and and this transfer portal sure has uh, turned into a crazy topic. Isn't it? Isn't it insane, Brett? That even now that we're in the last year of the transfer portal, that the activity, the amount of movement that's happening, does this surprise you a bit, or is this something you were expecting? It does. I guess it'll be interesting to see next year. Is it off steroids a little bit once those fifth years are gone? You know, this is the last year of the fifth year eligibility because of COVID. Uh, maybe things cool down a little bit and it settles down. That would be the hope because it's uh, it's definitely crazy this year. You know, you talk about crazy, Brett. We always chuckle, uh, you know, at this time of year. We're like, well, we've got to get Brett on the show. Well, good thing he's only got the transfer portal, 27 meetings, and probably about a day and a half off total in between that time. Uh, how have things yeah. been? Have you gotten a chance to kind of get some R&R, &R, or is it back to the grind right away? No, we've been uh, we've been grinding it out pretty good. Obviously, we're w working on a couple guys that uh, we're recruiting that are in the portal right now. There's a couple holes we'd like to fill if we could. Um, that's kind of a 24/7 deal. We've been working on that, um, you know. And then, uh, like you said, doing the the individual player meetings with all our guys that takes quite a while. We do them first with the assistants. Uh, uh, those guys do them uh, position specific. So Shikar will meet with all the D, and RJ will meet with all the uh, forwards, and and uh, I'll meet with the goalies and, and uh, the entire team. But, um, you know, that takes a little while to get through as well. So get through all that, make sure all our guys are in a good spot, and then uh, and then you get into that kind of the portal hunting. 
I suppose, Brett, you know, talking about player meetings, I, I guess, you know, any sort of takeaways from, you know, what the players mentioned maybe about this season, you know, maybe how they felt things went, I guess, what were overall takeaways from some of the things you heard from the guys? Yeah, I think, you know what, it's it's just weird how it ended because um, if you had told us at the beginning of the year with this group that we'd finish third in the NCHC, that up until two weekends left, we'd be fighting for first in the NCHC. Um, if we had to win one game to get to the NCAA tournament, I think with all the turnover, we all would have taken that. Um, and we would have all felt pretty good about it, hypothetically. But you don't feel good about it, I, hypothetically. You don't feel good about it in the real world because there was just too many games that slipped away. Uh, a couple nights where we really needed to put a team away and didn't. Those early season games, a couple of them, where, you know, the one thing about college hockey is game one through four is as important as game 32 through 36. And, uh, you know, with a young team, we let a couple slip away there. So um, I think what made it even more frustrating, and I think on the positive side, more motivating for next year was how hard the guys did fight with all that to still be one game away from making the tournament Um, and uh, making it down to the X for for our league playoff, winning a big playoff series here. Um, Those things were all really positive signs for this team uh, at the end of the year. You talk about kind of the balance, too. We've been, at least for us in show history, we've been treated pretty well as Huskies fans, all things considered, for the past couple of years. We're talking about a team that, you know, minus the auto bids, finished in a pairwise spot at 16 to make the tournament. And we're talking about that being a disappointing year. How much do you go back and think about, you know, that adjustment of, yeah, maybe we thought it was quote unquote mediocre compared to the standards that we've had, but how about how great that standard has risen for you guys? That's what's great about St. Cloud State Hockey right now. Um, a year like this, where we're 16th in the country, third in the league, make our league, you know, win a league playoff, get down to the X, and that still is disappointing. That's a good thing to me. Um, that means this program has the right standards and the right belief in itself, and uh, uh, the guys are going to use that as motivation. I feel like it's a chip on the shoulder team. Guys really. You know, to have it so close and not get it, um, I think that hurt even more. And um, and I think that's what's really going to motivate motivate this group going into the next season. And Brett, to kind of piggyback off that a bit, you know, as a coach, I believe this is the first time you missed the tournament with St. Cloud State. I guess, how does it feel from your perspective, being behind the bench, um, when that game against Denver ended, how did that feel uh, right there in that moment? Yeah, not good. Obviously, um, disappointing. You, you be, we believed all year we were going to make it. Um, we thought that uh, we had the team to do it. We uh, we there was a lot of belief in the room. You know, we hit just a tough stretch down this. You know, our last four games, Denver comes in and and, and they're rolling and, and they beat us a couple. We go up to Duluth and actually, you know, out shoot them significantly both nights and played one of our best games of the year on a Friday or on a Saturday night and get it to overtime late with only six seconds left on Friday. Thought we played some pretty good hockey up there and come away with one point. Um, that was disappointing. Um, you know, you win a couple of those, you're in the tournament. And uh, I think that that's, that's the, that's the lesson for everybody, everybody on the team. Um, something we've discussed is how every day matters. Every game matters. You know, that that first game against St. Thomas is as important as, you know, the last game against Duluth and uh, having that mentality. So, um, yeah, certainly disappointed. Uh, Never happy when you don't make the tournament. Proud of this group, though, in a lot of ways, to be honest. Um, One of the most consistent groups we've had in in some ways. Um, Only 10 regulation losses all year. That's pretty impressive. But on the other side of it, we couldn't get over the hump of putting teams away when we needed to and get that full regulation win or that overtime win. And and I thought that was the difference. You know, you get a couple of those done, you make the tournament. So uh, our standard here is to make the tournament. Doesn't feel good this year. Um, Proud, though, of of a lot of things the team did do and and excited about where we think we can get to next year. Well, we'll try to sift through all of the the, the negative crap early here. My final question kind of about uh, that perspective is, you know, we've seen in years past, and you've mentioned it yourself, every season is a different jigsaw puzzle you have to try to put yep. together. And some years feel a little bit easier than others. You know, you go back a couple of years, you know, Grant Cruikshank, Yami Cronulla, guys that you could just pencil in into a top six and you know they're going to be there. With so much turnover this year, did you feel like it was a more difficult challenge trying to fight the, find the right mix? Or do you think it was just a little bit of you felt like you had a little bit of good momentum, but then the results just weren't matching the mix that you had? I mean, did it feel just like more uphill slog compared to other years or, or just kind of a... Well, 
Yeah, in some ways, like we, we, you know, we, we changed lines this year more than we ever have. You know, we could never really find the exact mix that we wanted. Um, then we had some injuries here and there and things that happened. But what I really, what, what's interesting to me or, or the hard part for me is, um, you know, we play uh, North Dakota and Denver, or sorry, uh, Denver on the road and North Dakota right after Christmas. And I remember we beat Denver on a Saturday night in a shootout. We beat North Dakota Saturday night in a shootout. And I remember looking at the staff after that North Dakota game saying, if we play like this, we're going to win a lot of hockey games. Because even though we went technically, you know, o two 2 and 2 on the weekend, uh, we thought we played some of our best hockey against two of the best teams in the country. Um, there was really only a couple weeks stretch where we didn't feel we played well. You know, we lost in overtime uh, and in a shootout to Omaha at home. And then we went out to CC and only won in, in, uh, in overtime and uh, only got two points out there. Uh, it was kind of those couple weekends where we felt that our game really took a dip. Uh, we come out of that, we go into Miami and get six points, which was huge uh, to get us kind of back on track and going again. Um, so there really, that was, it was that two weekends there in the middle of the year where we just thought our game was off and didn't play well. I don't know if you remember the Friday night against UNO, but we had big leads. We had, you know, four, two, six, four. Uh, at one point, you know, I think the score was three to one uh, late in the second. We were out shooting him at that point, 27 to seven um, in a game that we really needed to just put them away and weren't able to. Um, and and you go through those little bit of swings. And then the only other negative point of the year was really the last four games where Denver came in and beat us up pretty good. And and to be honest, I thought we played really well up in Duluth, but didn't get much puck luck. So um, there weren't many weekends where this team was bad. Uh, unfortunately, um, there were just a couple too many weekends where we didn't get over the hump and, and finish those games off. Nick, I just want to jump in real quick. The only other one down the stretch, by the way, that maybe was – one that you guys wanted on a Friday night. Do you think that puck in Camrose's glove against Western Michigan was oh. on the back of the net? Mm-hmm. The fact of the matter, well, we all know it was. The, the officials know it was. Everybody knows it was. Um, unfortunately, with the technology of, of the cameras, you couldn't clearly see the glove, the puck go into the glove on video. Um, the way the rules are in our league, the refs can't infer, even though everybody knows it was in. It is tough to think about you know, that goal maybe being the difference in us making the tournament or not, which, which it, 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 you know, technically uh, could have made the difference. So uh, it was our job not to let it make the difference though. Um, it was our job to get a win against Denver at home and, and not, not let it matter. Our job to go up to Duluth and get a win and not let it matter. So I don't, I don't worry about it too much because even though it stings and, and there's a chance we win that game and it changes things, we needed to get a win or two down the stretch here to secure that. We, and we weren't able to. That was a tough game, right? I was in the press box alongside the CBS crew and, and got a look at uh, what the uh, officiating was seeing and, you know, just asked them point blank after the game. And they just said, it's not that we couldn't see the puck in the glove. They couldn't see it at all. It was just for whatever reason, you know, just, it was tough. And uh, like you said, yeah. I, I think everybody in the building, including the ones in stripes uh, knew the puck was in the net. Uh, Brett, but I think to switch gears a little bit, Noah, just because I think, uh, you know, as, as we've looked at this team and we've looked at the makeup, as you mentioned, a young squad, um, speaking of the young bodies, uh, I, I think there's a lot to be excited for, for St. Cloud fans with some of the talent that's coming in for next season. What's sort of your take on, you know, some of the guys that are coming in to be future Huskies? Well, yeah, I'll, I'll start with the guys that came this year because, um, you know, as we're penciling that lineup, our number one and two centers are freshmen. You don't see that in the NCHC very often. Uh, the growth of of uh, Mietin and, and Gross um, into legitimate top tier centermen in this league was was really to me one of the main things that kept us in the hunt all year. And actually, you know, like you said, we finished top sixteen in the country. Most teams, that's a pretty good year. Um, and and that was led by two freshmen down the middle. Uh, sometimes Jack Ryman at center, three of our four freshmen uh, playing center down the middle, one of the most important positions. Uh, Mason Salquist, always a really good, solid third line center, or sometimes second. He, he kind of fluctuates in that area, but uh, he was really good for us. Um, we wondered where our offense was, offense was going to come from, and we're really proud that we scored the same amount of goals this year as we did the year before. Um, which was huge, but that took career years from Kyler Kupka. That took a career year from a, um, you know, a guy like Adam Ingram. And then obviously uh, the production of those freshmen, including a guy like Barrett Hall, 
um, really, really helped a lot. So, you know, and BD scoring 20, obviously. So uh, the biggest concern going into the year was how do we how do we reproduce the offense that we lost from the year before? And we did that. Um, now going into this next year, having Gross, Mietnan, uh, Hall, uh, Ingram, those type of guys up front. Now you add in a Austin Bernovic, who's right now uh, second in the USHL in goal scoring, uh, hoping he could finish first. Um, Gavin Thorson, who's top 10 in points and top 10 in assists in the league. Um, those will be the, the two main guys that come in as freshmen. We see those guys as guys like Hall and and, and uh, Gross and, and Mietten and that are going to step right in and be impact guys. So I think when you start adding that mix up, um, we are going to be young again next year up there with a lot of freshmen and sophomore talent with our skill level. Uh, but they're guys that are difference makers, and, and it's exciting. And then you put the rest of the core around those guys, guys that have been here for a while. And and I hate sometimes when I'm I'm at home right now. I don't have a, a roster right in front of me, and I, I hate if I miss anybody. But you know, you got the Jack Ryman's who who gave us a lot of speed and energy, and then you get the older guys like Ashan and the Coin and. Uh, Roseboro and Rogers and, and those type of guys that really fill out a lineup well. And then you have a Nick Ports who came in and had a really good end of the season for us and uh, kind of made some noise there, I thought, and played well and and is going to put himself in the in the hunt next year. So um, we've got the supporting cast, I, th- I believe, guys that can fill those roles really well, and we've definitely got some young talent up front. Yeah, and a young goaltender to boot, Brett, that obviously you started to trust a little bit more as uh, things went along. Best of luck to Dominic Bassey for his jump uh, going to St. Lawrence next year. Uh, And also the other one I kind of want to mention, a couple of guys that you are going to miss. And uh, historically, the transfer portal has been very kind to you in the defensive position. You might need it again next year. For a guy like Jack Peart, who made the jump uh, just about a week and a half ago, we kind of didn't know if he would stay one more year or not. Did you guys know right away, or did it did it take some time? Do you think for him? No, it it was he was ready. You know, Uh, he had a good year. Um, The Wild made a good pitch, um, and I think uh, it was the right time for him to go. We're excited for him. Um, There was some hope mid season that maybe we'd have him back. And uh, we were we were really hoping that that could work out. But as the year went on and the way the way he was playing at the end and the interest that the Wild were showing and, and what some of their needs are, um, I think it was good for Jack. And I'm excited for him. Obviously, a uh, big hole for the Huskies. Um, and uh, we definitely are out there looking to fill that. But uh, uh, we've got a really good freshman defenseman coming in, uh, Thor Bufflin. Mm-hmm. Uh, Thor is having a great year in uh, in Chicago right now. Um, he's having a really good year. He's played a lot of junior hockey. He's out of Rozo. Um, he's going to fill a, a role for us with a puck moving uh, defenseman for sure, which is great. Um, we may need to dip into the portal to find one more, but uh, we're excited to have Thor come in. And then speaking of guys that uh, maybe also you're going to miss to uh, VD Miatinen and posted something on Instagram, you know, thinking St. Cloud for four years. Um, I don't want to be the cryptic guy that sort of, you know, reads between the lines. But uh, Brett, is there anything official on VD Miatinen in terms of his status with St. Cloud State? You know, he's uh, he and I had a meeting at Christmas and another one at the end of the year. BD's ready for pro hockey. He's just not sure where it's going to be yet. He's got opportunities back at home. He's sorting some things out here. Um you know, he's he's ready to move on and play pro hockey. So uh, we're excited for him to love to have him back for that fifth year. But uh, he's kind of at that point in his life where he's ready to move on and play pro hockey. But boy, what a career he had. Yeah. Um, yes, a lot he of, did. Obviously, a lot of goals, a lot of big moments for us. Uh, he's going to be missed big time. Yeah, and you talk about, we kind of mentioned ever since the end of his freshman year, you were looking for that extra gear in his game. Well, I think he definitely found it and maybe found another this season. Just the growth that he showed, um, you know, can't say enough about him. We wanted him to get to the gritty areas. We wanted him to make those extra plays. Um, he looked like, this is a weird phrase to say, but vintage Vidi Mietnin with an extra gear, if that makes sense. I agree. I agree. He gave everything he had. Heck, he was on the penalty kill this year. I think as a freshman, <laughs> he would have never said BD Manton is going to be on the penalty kill. He rounded out his game. He competed harder. He played more consistent, scored for us. And again, we needed that to get into that spot where we were and, and have a chance. And, and VD definitely came through for us. He's also a great kid. I just enjoyed being with him every day. Uh, personally, for me, I'm going to miss seeing him at the rink. He's he's one of those guys that you're going to miss having around. You know, the yeah, other exactly. kind of, oh, sorry, well, I was just the follow up that I was going to go originally was 
Also, something that's kind of uncharacteristic from you, Brett, um, and I don't know, it, we've always kind of speculated, so maybe, I guess, what are you going to do? Fire us. We're not going to have a show in a week. But um, uh-huh. Quinnipiac a couple years ago, we talked about kind of the crutch per se of go- riding a single goaltender through the season. Yep. This year, you go a bit uncharacteristic. You trust a young player. Dominic Bassey just unfortunately didn't get the call late in the year. How big of a of a trust does it take to put a young goaltender in the mix and be able to say, you know what, he's going to be our guy? You know what, he earned it. Um, I'll tell you what was a little bit unfortunate, uh, and, and maybe people didn't know quite a bit at the time, was he went in and played just an unbelievable game at Denver when we got that shootout win. I mean, I'm telling you, they had grade A after grade A in the overtime, probably 10 of them. Uh, he played unreal and unfortunately he pulled his oblique muscle in that game and uh, was not able to dress for the next three weeks. I still wonder um, what could have happened in those yeah. next three weeks if we had him playing at that level. Um, unfortunately, he couldn't uh, kind of, you know, started a little bit of our 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 downswing there uh, where we had a few rough weeks. Uh, but I still wonder if he had stayed healthy because you know what he did, he earned trust, he earned trust with his teammates, he earned trust with us. Um, he bounced back after a really tough weekend at home against Denver and had a really good game up in Duluth. And then obviously, uh, won a playoff series in the NCHC and that's not easy, uh, against a tournament team. And I think that says a lot, uh, about where he's headed as a goalie. And that's not the first time, Noah, that St. Cloud has had a freshman goaltender. Uh, Let's go back to David Rennick, right, who was in that same position as a freshman. Uh, Brett, you know, I suppose, you know, for goaltending, and I know just from, um, shall we say, hockey and chill, I knew that was probably not the best idea to try to break down goaltending film uh, in the past. But uh, I I suppose, what did you like about his game, you know, just in terms of not just making those great A saves, but, you know, anything in particular jumped out to the coaching staff that said, you know what, we want to give this guy more of an extended look. Well, a lot of it you see it in practice every day, right? Uh, there's a constant competition within practice. Uh, I liked his ability to play pucks. I thought that helped us a lot. Um, I thought it helped on our penalty kill and our breakouts and, and different things. Uh, he just trended to look more confident and, uh, to be honest, uh, was getting the results and, and had the numbers and uh, was able to find ways to get it done. So it was really a gut decision for us. Hard one down the stretch. Um but at the end of the day, like I said, we feel we made the right one. I mean, here's a kid that goes in as a freshman and beats Western Michigan in the two out of three game series, uh, takes Denver to overtime. Uh, pretty tough to take that Denver team to overtime right now. They're, mm-hmm. they're a heck of a team. And, and uh, although they, it's funny I say that, they've been in overtime a few times since. But uh, um, that's a heck of a team. I thought that uh, he really showed down the stretch that he's got the opportunity to be the guy for us next year. Jimmy Gray is going to push him, no doubt. And we're going to bring in a goalie in the, out of the transfer portal that we think will we'll have the ability to push both of them as well. But we're really excited about the growth and development of Isaac Posh. Now, Brett, we mentioned we're recording this show on April 7th. For those doing the math, Frozen 4 hasn't happened by the time the show comes out. Frozen 4 will be done. Uh, first of all, uh, as we mentioned, the perspective that you haven't had in a while, you get to kind of sit back and watch a little bit of regional hockey, get a chance to watch the Frozen 4 what do you think about the regional so far? And I guess to pick your brain, who's going to win the whole darn thing? You know what? Number one, I hate watching when we're not in. I hate <laughs> it. I talked to our players about it too. I, I watched a little bit here and there. I uh, watched our league teams. You know, you're pulling for our league, right? Um, you always are. Uh, we want our league to do well. It helps in recruiting. It, it, it helps everything that we do. So I, I'm going to pick Denver then. I'm going to pick <laughs> our league to uh, go in there as the only only team in our league to go in and win it. And uh, obviously worked with Coach Carl on the, uh, on the World Junior staff this year and and uh, wishing them the best and hoping the NCHC can get it done. And Brent, I want to piggyback off that a little bit, you know, spending some time with David Carl on the bench, I I suppose, you know, his win loss record, you know, shows you everything is what, you know, coach it is, but, you know, spending time, he says, what are some, have you been able to pick some things from working with him? You know, I guess what, what sort of your impressions with him and why he's able to just do what he continues to do with that program down in Denver? Well, first off, he's extremely detailed, hardworking, incredibly smart. So um, that's a good good place to start from. Um, he understands the game. He understands people. Uh, he has a really good way of working with with really high end players. You can see that a lot of patience, 
allowing them to be who they are and play their game. Uh, I thought he did a good job of, you know, managing our staff and putting us in positions to be successful. And, and obviously the big part of it is picking the team. Uh, I think he, he listened to a lot of the voices in the room, picking the team, but at the end of the day, he had a vision for who that team needed to be as well. So uh, I think in all, all those areas, he did a great job on that and it showed with the result. And obviously it's showing where, the, uh, where they're at in Denver as well right now. One of the most dominant world junior teams we have seen from the U.S. in quite a while. I guess my question for you, did you take the plane back with them to Magnus Arena? How did that work? That's got to be an awkward, all right, good luck, we'll see you in a day. It's an odd thing when you leave those tournaments. So uh, one thing that, that's really hard about it is you don't get much time together. I've been in two. Uh, we lost in a quarterfinal and a heartbreaker to Finland uh, the first time and obviously winning it this time. But literally, um, they've got to book the tickets uh after you win the quarterfinal game so that's not many days so you're jumping on different flights everybody's separated kind of uh i can tell you this last year it was odd the buses started coming to the hotel uh to bring people to the airports at 3 a.m and they were going at like 3 4 30 6 8 um i wasn't on the flight till about or the bus till about eight o'clock uh back to minnesota um he was on a different flight but you don't have enough time to celebrate or 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 to kind of spend time together if it was a tough loss it's a weird deal you're literally just packing up spending a couple hours together and everybody's on the planes home that's pretty nuts uh brett you know we've been doing this show now for about four years um you know and i suppose it would be hard not to kind of pick your brain about you know the last four years minus maybe the national championship run maybe some great husky moments that you can maybe think off the top of your head that we've had the pleasure to cover you know pretty much in detail last four years i mean i know there's probably a plethora um and yeah i want to maybe lead anybody up but there any a couple that sneak on the top of your head well i, I you know i i really liked uh for these last two years have been really re- rewarding to be honest because neither year were we picked to be much more than a mid-pack team and uh you know you put the you get the addition of anhorn and crookshank the year before and and um Boy, I remember the sweep of Mankato at home in front of a packed building that year was was unbelievable. And I know I'm going to leave out some things here and there. But um, and then, you know what, we went through it. What people have forgot about last year is we went through a tough stretch where it was funny because it was when I was trying to get my 100th win. Uh, RJ had packed a bottle of champagne and I think it took about eight games to get there in regulation. (laughs) Uh, We went through an 04 and 4 stretch, I believe. And boy, the fans were getting on us and people were getting upset and and that's all part of it. Um, um, so I would say that winning the league championship that year and proving ourselves again and even to our own fans and, um, you know, winning that championship was it was a great moment. Um, you know, maybe beating North Dakota the night before was just as good and, um, you know, uh, beating a huge rival down there at the X. But uh, that championship um, was really special. I, I thought just for the way it all played out and, and how important it was. And then obviously beating, uh, beating Mankato in the regional, uh, was big, um, and, and a tough loss to Minnesota, but I thought our team that year had given it everything they had, everything. And I thought the same this year too. Uh, we weren't as mature of a team this year. You could see it. We lost some alphas in the room. There were guys that had led for like three years, you know, the spent Spencer Meyer and, and Bushy and a guy, Aiden Spellacy and Micah Miller. These guys were big, uh, you know, leader leaders. And, uh, um, I took a while for our guys to grow into that. I thought Anhorn did a really good job. Um, I think the guys did the best they, they could, uh, but it wasn't quite the same mature older team that we had the year before. And I thought for our youth this year, uh, as disappointing as it was to, to miss the tournament, I thought we did a lot of really good things. Like some of those games I mentioned to you against North Dakota and Denver at home, uh, or North Dakota at home, Denver on the road. Obviously, something we haven't done in years around here, going into Western Michigan and get a sweep on the road. We felt like we won the Stanley Cup that weekend. Uh, we hadn't done that a long time. Um, and then to win a playoff series this year, I, yeah. I don't want people to forget that this team still made it to the X. Um, unfortunately, a couple – non-conference games that we could have won in overtime and didn't and maybe a puck that was in the net was the difference between us being in the tournament and not but this team didn't quit they've won a huge series at home against western uh and they took denver to overtime and tyson gross hit the post in the third period and who knows that goes posting in instead of posting out might be a different story so uh could be still playing but uh 
I guess it's hard for me to, maybe I just ripped off too many there, but uh, no. <laughs> those are, those are some that, those are some over the last couple of years that I, I, I'm really proud of. I know that we've had a lot of blast and show history kind of going over our moments. And um, I'd like to say we've had a few growth and development things too, from when we first started. Uh, fun fact, I, I did check this before the show, Brett, any idea when your first appearance on the Huskies Warming House podcast was? Oh. What, what episode? One. <laughs> Not that early. Episode 11. No, come on. Episode 11. Episode 11. Yeah, he's got it. All right. It. Come on. You guys should have had the head coach on first. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. The first well, episode. <laughs> should we tell him no one? Oh, my gosh. So oh. the, the first episode. Who was the first? Who was um, first? Actually, nobody. So the first okay. episode was the idea of the whole podcast yeah. was not really be a podcast at all. It's supposed to be a, a UTVS television show. Like a talk show. Uh, okay. we, actually, yeah. we actually yeah. dragged three full camera equipment sets and we actually recorded in one of the uh, one of the end of the ice suites over there on the uh, south side of the building, and uh, it was just me and you, uh, meaning you Noah, and we set up all three cameras. We recorded it, and that footage has not been released. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it was that, and then KVSC Studio One essentially yeah. was what our first real studio was and i i think you no know, if i remember correctly our, uh, our first actual guests were actually women's hockey players it was actually uh yep. dana rasmussen who was uh the nice. first so yeah um good i believe you well, well i will tell you you guys do a great job i gotta tell you that to your face i've, I've told it to you before and you're gonna be missed big time i think this has done nothing but give our program a lot of really positive coverage and and what i like is you guys aren't afraid to talk about the tough times too. And we're all going to go through them. And there's going to be some times when, when the fans are upset and, and people are discouraged, but uh, I've always felt you guys have handled that the right way. Um, uh, being honest about the negatives, but you've also done a really good job. I think pointing out the positives and, and you've been a really big uh, supporter and, and help of our program here over these last four years. And I think it gives us a lot of, um, it gives us a lot of attention. It gives us a, a good deep look into the program. Uh, where people, you know, I think the more that they can get to know that these kids are human beings and the coaches are too, and <laughs> that we're all in this thing together. And, and, and when, the more they get to know us, I think the more fans uh, want to be a part of it. Yeah, and I think a lot of people think that you're supposed to be a robot. It is just a hockey game after all. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I know that's shocking to a lot of people. I do remember, uh, first of all, we appreciate it, Brett. Uh, you know, you've been nothing but kind to us. And I do remember uh, when we kind of, uh, again, as you mentioned, kind of toe the line a little bit because it's not easy to talk about those difficult things and be critical. Um, but I do remember a, maybe it was your third, maybe fourth time on the show. You mentioned something to us off air about like, well, you guys see it and you guys get it. And I was like, well, if Brett Larson thinks we get it, maybe we maybe we're doing OK. Um, yeah. There is a time where I didn't get it one time, though. This was very early on in show history. Um, I went back and watched the footage you ever remember a certain very young Noah Grant saying a certain shot was ill-advised against North Carolina? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. <laughs> and, I will, yeah. and I will never remember where you just pause and you're like, what do you mean by ill-advised? And there's, a, for those who don't know, when you do the post-game presser, I mean, the guys are all up front, but there's, oh, what would you say, maybe 10, 12 people in the room at any given time yep. doing doing yep. interviews? and. Here, I, I didn't think Brett was going to ask me a question back. And what do I mean by <laughs> ill-advised? Oh, <laughs> I I remember that to this day, actually. Yeah, it's no, funny because you know it was more it was more of like, well, it, what do you mean it's ill-advised? The puck went in the net. Like, what the heck? <laughs> <laughs> I'll never I'll never forget that either. And and Brett to echo what what Noah has said. Uh, I I think you know not speaking for Noah, but I think you would be in the same, uh, same side of the coin as I am. You know, it's, it's a relationship, right? Yes. We, we talk about St. Claude State hockey. Yes. We, 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 we eat, sleep and bleed hockey. We just really do. But this program and more so the people that invite us, us in, and even going back to my time with Husky productions and, you know, doing the hockey and chills with you. I mean, I still, for me, that's, those are the fonder memories going back and just developing that relationship, talking shop, talking film, but, you know, to have a program that's been so inviting and allowed us to be a part of your journey year in and year out. I mean, we really have you and your staff, um, Andrew Melro, uh, you know, many others to thank to make this possible. So I, I think, you know, just to kind of put it from our perspective, we have, you know, as much as maybe you think us, we have to thank you and your staff yeah. as well for everything that, you know, where the show has really gone. 
No, I appreciate that. And I think that hopefully what you guys have seen and, and, and maybe it, it helps um, is you see how we treat people. You see it is a family feel around our program. We, we want to treat people the right way. It's something we talk to our players about all the time. And, and I think the more you guys got in there and saw that, hopefully um, it made you even more um, excited to be a part of it. And uh, I think we've got a really good group of people and, and we want to make sure we show that off. Yeah, fun fact, if you're ever covering Huskies hockey, by the way, though, Brett, very nice guy, very easy to interview. Don't ask him player questions over the course of a weekend, though, because you better have a follow-up question very quickly. Um, <laughs> I, I guess my question for you this uh, for this one, Brett, is, um, you know, there's a lot of coaches who play things a little bit different. I would say your predecessor, Bob Motzko, is a little bit more reserved when it comes to the media. Have you always been someone who's felt like you've been open and willing to talk a little bit of shop with media guys or did that kind of come over time too because to be honest you're a pretty easy interview as far as a lot of head coaches at that level go you know what's funny is i've never given it much thought i I think it's just who i am i I don't really have a plan i don't really have a a shtick uh (laughs) you know i i I just kind of come out and talk to you like i'm talking to a friend and uh that's kind of how i've just always done it now Certainly there's things in my head that I'm thinking I can't say, or this is, you know, something I don't want to give away, or there's, th- you know, things like that, or, or maybe there's some messages I want to make sure get out that I think can help our team and, and that I want the public to know about it. But for the most part, I've, I've just been a big believer in, in being myself and, and, uh, and being as open as I can. Honestly, I mean, and, and I think, you know, when you say, uh, you know, just moments ago that, you know, we hope that the more we did it, the more we felt like it was a family. Um, I would disagree on that just because we felt it the moment yeah. that we started this. I mean, seriously, uh, you know, because normally you're 100 percent correct. Normally there's sort of that feeling out period. Normally there is the, you know, can we trust these guys? I mean, these guys are just knuckleheads sitting in front of a microphone talk thinking they know what the heck they're talking about. Right. But no, um, the invitation, you know, that the family atmosphere, we really felt it day one from you guys. So, uh, no, I don't think there really was any transition time at all from you guys, Brett. And then again, that's yeah. just a um, uh, you just all the more just reason why if you're sitting out there if you're a fan or if you're a young hockey player this program really from top to bottom you know not only do they develop nhl quality talent uh but not only you're gonna have fun you're gonna make lifelong friends brothers whatever you call it but it's it's just a great place to go to experience college hockey and to have some great people along the way yeah and i think that people don't really understand that with the ins and outs. It's easy to, especially if you're a fair weather fan. And I think that, you know, that's not taking anything away from, like if you're new to the game of hockey, you're learning Huskies hockey for the first time. It's easy to look at it from the outside. Like when I watch a Vikings game, I know very little about football. So it's easy for me to scream at the TV, right? Um, But at the same time, Brad, I guess my kind of question for you, um, you know, you have those periods where you have that outside outside noise, that negativity, you know, guys, uh, you know, maybe not always believing in you, kind of not trusting the process. How do you tune that out? And really, if you have new Huskies fans, what do you want them to ultimately know about this program that, yeah, there may be a stretch where you lose six or seven in a row. What do you want them to know about the ins and outs, regardless of the result? Well, the one thing that matters the most to me is that the people that believe in the process are in our dressing room. And when it gets to that point, we will talk about, guys, it's us against everybody right now. <laughs> Even some of our own fans right now are on us to the point where uh, maybe they don't believe in us. And, and sometimes you can use that to motivate this group where it's us against the world type feel. And um, and, and that's some sometimes as a coach, you got to go to that spot. It doesn't mean we don't uh, understand the fans' frustration. They want to win. They're passionate. They love this team. Um, hey, I you know I hate when the Vikings lose. I I get it. You know, so I'm I'm a fan of other <laughs> other things. They, and they uh, lose a uh, lot, sadly. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. So I get it. But and I and I and I love the passion of our fans. But sometimes you have to use that with your team. Um, you have to use the fact that everybody's on us right now. It's uh, it's the only people that matter are the people in this room right here and we're going to find a way to get it done together um and i think if you look at our track record over the years we've been pretty good at coming out of those tough stretches um and and you're not you're not gonna i i've never been a part of a year really where you don't hit a tough stretch it's going to happen here or there you're going to hit a tough year every once in a while um and that's going to happen there's good programs that go through tough years so uh the biggest thing that i i got to make sure is i don't lose the belief 
in our locker room and that those players believe in us as a staff and in each other and the process of what we're trying to build. And I've never, at least to this point, knock on wood, um, felt like we, we've, we've lost that. We've just had a great group of kids, and I think the proof's in the pudding when they keep coming through those tough stretches and really coming out on top. And that really is, Brett, I would imagine, a sort of a, a an accolade to not only to your recruiting because – I mean, and it's different now, right? With the transfer portal, right? Because you're you're kind of doing your own recruiting from the younger kids, and you're also keeping tabs on, you know, some of the movement that's out there. But I would imagine, you know, the the chemistry, the culture, you know, the husky way, as you call it, you know, that really comes down to not just knowing the hockey player, but knowing knowing the people. Is there, you know, is there sort of a litmus test to use for that, or I guess how do you know that a player comes in and fits to be a Central State Husky? We do a lot of homework on that. I mean, one of the biggest parts of recruiting is everyone knows who the good players are, who are the ones that are going to fit for you. And, you know, we've always had a little bit of a blue collar feel around here. It's, it's, you know, we don't, we treat people the right way. Um, uh, the team comes first. All those things are, are really important. And finding guys that are going to fight, especially with the transfer portal right now, making sure you have the right guys that are going to fight through the adversity, fight through the hard times. And that adversity might be a losing stretch or for a player, it might be in and out of the lineup uh, or not in the line that he wants to be on. Um, because right now the grass is always greener in the portal. You can go wherever you want. So making sure that you have the right kids that are going to fight through those tough moments. And obviously as a staff, it's our job to help them through those tough moments and, and use those as teaching and learning experiences. But um I think those relationships, that culture, uh, the Husky way, we do as much digging as we can to make sure any recruit we bring in here is going to fit into that. My final question for you, Brett, and again, thank you so much over the past four and a half years for joining us and giving us the time. We couldn't thank you enough. Um, what's on the agenda for the next couple of weeks and what are you most excited for heading into hockey season next year? Well, uh, obviously, we've got some uh, uh, some irons in the fire in the portal. Uh, we're working on that. That's a that's a battle. Um, so we'll we'll go through that. We really love the group that's coming back. Um, I think I will get some downtime here. Our, our downtime usually is our coaches' convention down in Naples, in Florida. I'm kind of looking forward to that at the end of the end of the month. Um, hopefully, by then we'll have some uh, our commitments out of the portal that we're hoping to have, um, and we can relax a little bit there. But what excites me about next year really is this young group getting better and uh, who's going to be our next VD Mietnan, you know, um, who, who's going to grow into our next Grant Crookshank or our next Yami Cranola, um, our next Jack Peart, our next Dylan Anhorn. And uh, that's always the fun part as a coach. That's open right now. There's opportunity right now. And there's a lot of good players that if they have a great summer and are fully committed, have the opportunity to step in those roles and grow. So um, it's fun. It's fun right now when you have a young team turning over that you believe in. And um, believe me, I'm going to enjoy some downtime in May. But come June, I'm going to be itching to get this hockey season going and, and get this team back together. It's funny because it goes from what 100 miles an hour to zero and then zero to 100 again, right? And you wouldn't really have it any other way, would you, Brett? <laughs> no, no. It is one thing I love about coaching, to be honest, though. You get those moments where you can kind of throttle back for a little bit. Um, like I said, right now, I'm um, I'm looking forward to this. I, I enjoy the recruiting process. It's something I've always enjoyed uh, being in college hockey coaching. So we're in the thick of it right now with some of these transfer kids. I mean, you know, if you look at the portal, there's there's a certain amount of kids that are difference makers. Well, that means every school pretty much is on those difference makers. How do you find a way to get one of those kids? And, and uh, boy, we've been battling at it right now. Our staff's been working really hard, and it's it's been fun to do. Um, you know, there are some negatives of the portal with the kids that are grass is greener, just looking to leave for those reasons. You know, that scares me a little bit. Um, you hope there's not things happening behind the scenes too much that are illegal that – that are the negative sides of the portal. Um, but from the positive side, um, if you can find the right kid that fits your culture and help your team, it's a good thing. So uh, we're kind of working through all that. And then uh, looking forward to our guys come back for a camp in the summer. They'll come back in June for a couple of weeks uh, before they head out to NHL development camps. Then they'll be back uh, for school in mid-August. So it's funny from right now until August 15th actually goes by like a blur. And, uh, and we get the team back and we're ready to go. Yeah, hopefully. I got more uh, uh, questions. I, I was just going to say, hopefully he paid attention in, in his marketing classes because that's the new caveat nice. that you get to learn here, Brad. And, of course, a golf tournament as well, too, around that time. Yep. We do. Yep. 
we'll have uh, our alumni golf tournament. Um, we, we have another thing, and I don't know if I've talked about it on here, our pro camp. So uh, right at the beginning, middle August, when our players return, uh, all our pros come back to train for the week. Mm-hmm. So that's a great event. Um, they train together. They scrimmage together. They're in our weight room working out, helping the pro guys prepare to leave. Boy, we've got a lot of guys doing great out there right now, and I don't want to miss anybody. But um, you got – I'm just thinking of some of the teams. You know, you've got Isamon and Perbix down in Tampa. you got uh, Lazado out in L.A. You've got three guys in Washington. Washington. Hopefully they can make the playoffs with Dow Jensen and um, sorry Lingren, um, Ryan Paling yeah. finding a really nice niche in in, in Philadelphia right now. Um, boy, I'm, I'm, I'm hope I'm not missing somebody off the top of my head. I might be, but uh, those are the guys that kind of come to mind right now. And fun to see so many Huskies doing well. It's fun to have those guys back training with our guys. Really, really fun, Brad. And again, my phone. Oh, Will, Bo- Will Borgen. Will Borgen. Will Borgen, yeah, over in Seattle. You know, up in Seattle. So didn't want to forget about him. But uh, there's guys like that that are just making this program really proud with what they're doing in the NHL. And there's uh, plenty of NHL draft picks on your current raw current roster, right, Brett? So, I mean, the, the, the development continues. And I think that's one thing that we want to hit home is, you know, St. Cloud's a great place to play college hockey. It's also a good place to prep you for uh, pro hockey as well. Which leads me to my, my final question for you, Brett. Uh, I think college hockey in a whole, right? Uh, you talked about the college hockey coaches meetings coming up here at the end of the month. I think there's a lot of pretty important topics that are probably going to be discussed. Uh, I want to get your thoughts on two of them. Uh, One, I want to get your thoughts on uh, essentially an article that Brad Schlossman wrote, and that was returning NCAA regionals to home sites. So I want to get your thoughts on that. And and then finally, uh, the state of college hockey um, as a whole, uh, I think that, you know, are we in a spot really, or should college hockey continue to expand? Should the NCAA field expand? I know I'm trying to unload a little bit uh just yep. a few on here but uh those would be in the top three i want to hear from you a little bit okay uh easy number one i'm full agreement with moving to uh, home sites for the regionals uh i think it protects the top seeds that's what you play for to earn the right uh to do that mm-hmm. um i think that's a really good thing i think that's something that most of the college hockey coaches are, are supporting um other issues uh within the game right now um i think the nil stuff has to get cleaned up somehow Uh, i think right now it's crazy town uh there has to be some uh limitations or or stipulations on this it's it's only going to make the rich richer Uh, it's only going to benefit the big schools i'm worried about parity college hockey same with the transfer portal um i'm not sure anyone intended it to be what it is right now and have 300 plus kids in the transfer portal um i think it's scary again i think it really uh, lends to a lot of abuse. I think there can be some behind the scenes things that mm-hmm. can get out of hand. And unfortunately, I worry about parity in college hockey. Um, you know, the days of, you know, I'm thinking back a few years ago now, but a union beating a Minnesota in a national championship game, or, mm-hmm. you know, um, there's been a lot of those, right? Um, you don't want to see those days go away. You want you want to see parity in this sport where anybody can beat anybody, and you hate to see it just turn into a five or six team deal that it's the same five or six teams every year. So I think we got to be really careful. We got to get our game back in a little bit uh, with some of these things with the portal, with the NIL uh, in specific. Um, those things for sure. But uh, one thing that I think is easy is is the uh, is the regional sites going to campus. I think that'd be a great idea. Certainly would agree, Brett, and uh, looking forward to what you guys can bring uh, as far as the package for the Huskies next year. Looking forward to some men's hockey. Of course, we won't be there, at least in the public forum, to cover it, but you will be there, of course, behind the bench um, getting ready for another great season of hockey. Brett, we wish you the best of luck, and thank you so much for your time, uh, and bid you adieu as the final guest here on the Huskies Warming House podcast. Thank you, guys. Thanks for everything you've done. Uh, like I told you in a, in a text, we're going to miss you big time. You've been a huge part of it around here, and we've appreciated everything. So best of luck to you guys in your futures. Appreciate it. Thanks so much, Brett. Brett. And Nick, that's a wrap on the final guest in Huskies Warming House podcast history. Thanks so much to Brett Larson for uh, joining us for all the years that he has over four and a half seasons. Uh, It's been fantastic. Pretty much one of the easiest interviews and a very candid interview, too. You can definitely, uh, especially once you get a little bit of a rapport with him, you can ask him those questions. You know, I mean, what do you think about this? This was not a, you know, not a glamorous thing. How, how do you perceive this? He's going to give you his honest answer, and I, I've always appreciated that about him. So, uh, yeah, men's hockey looking to rebound next season. Uh, we'll be watching with keen interest, even if we aren't in the public eye. But, Nick, this is it. 
our final show here on the Huskies Warming House podcast. I think you and I kind of talked about it uh, before last week. And I felt Mm -hmm. like last weekend, uh, like the first or second weekend of April, uh, you know, after we were sick, we came back for episode 206. It was kind of like that was when we finally started to realize like, oh, we're like truly done with this thing. And uh, does it feel like four and a half years? Yes and no. <laughs> That's such a Huskies Warming House podcast answer. <laughs> I know, right? Oh, my gosh. Um, you know, it, honestly, no. And, and you know, I, I think the only way I can answer that, Noah, is because, yeah, and, and before we were talking about this last week, Noah, I think we, we kind of joke slash discuss, you know, does it really hit us yet? And no. And even when I'm sitting here, talking about it i don't think it really has hit me even to this moment right. um but when you think about all the things that we've gone through and uh, we're going to talk about some of the shall we say the birth of the podcast plus you know the mm-hmm. how we really wanted this to look you know it was supposed to be a, a much bigger production yeah per se um but i really think noah that when you look at it all we have done and that i mean that includes um, like a, a COVID draft with a women's team, yeah. Uh, every national championship, um, doing off season, you know, sort of breakdowns on the other teams in the NCHC and this last off season with the WCHA, we put in a shit ton of work on yeah. this. Um, and I, and you know, I think it's funny how when it, just like an athlete, when it becomes routine, it's it's, it's almost like second nature, right? Yeah. And I think in a weird sense, you know, we're a Miko Koivu sort of ask where I don't think it's really going to fully hit us until we get to a couple of weeks after the show is mm-hmm. done and we're like kind of reaching for like, Oh, we don't got to do that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I, I guess, how do you feel? Does, has it been that long for you? Well, I think having the platform, right. Being able to see something that happens and having people listen to our perspective on it. And truly that's what this podcast is in a nutshell. I mean, yes, we both played the game. We're around people who played the game around really smart, smart hockey people. And we're just kind of interjecting to offer our perspective and provide a little bit of entertainment value. I mean, that's ultimately what a podcast is. It's ultimately what the game of hockey is, right? Work hard and provide a little bit of entertainment value, so to speak, but as you mentioned, it's a lot of freaking work to do a podcast. Yeah. And one of the things that, as you talked about, being able to do things quickly now, we'll go through a couple of elements graphically where, um, and, and to be fair, a lot of this show is still on a whim even tonight. And you yeah. think about the, you know, the opportunity, if we truly had time to put you know, certain effort levels into things, you know, how more polished and, and how fancier you can do things. But I think about some of the first days that, you know, and, and first couple months that we did stuff, especially figuring out things with COVID. Um, the work that we put in on the front end to get things going, they always say uh, the cliche phrase for if you're starting a business or a startup company, right? Your first year is always going to be your hardest. Podcasts yep. are no different. The work you have to put on the front end to get everything in place. Do you know how to do a streaming platform? Do you know how to link that to Apple Podcasts? Do you know how to reach your audience? How do you start to garner listeners? What unique things can you do? How do you, uh, as you evolve through a show, how do you provide a little bit of longevity? Because it's easy in year number one. Oh, your first Halloween, what's your favorite candy? What's your favorite movie? What's, you know, what's the great things that you do on Halloween? Oh, two line trivia. This is so great. We'll ask a trivia question with this. We'll do this. What do you do in year three? Yep. What do you do in year four? It, it it gets significantly more challenging to try to stay fresh and stay relevant, especially because your first two years you put so much time and effort into refining your craft, providing your product publicly so people can consume it, and being able to like naturally evolve and make those adjustments. As you go through the years, the things that become so routine also some be- become the most tiring sometimes, where it's yes. you know the bar that you've set and to maintain that standard, you have to find a way to do it. And in some cases do it more efficiently 
to be able to yes. package that that product quicker. When I when we first started this show, um, and not even episode zero, but when we first started, we were spending four, five, six hours in some cases uploading shows after we recorded them, trying to plan the show, trying to do it like it, it wasn't easy. Now we're at a point where, you know, we take an hour maybe two hours at maximum and from tip to tail, it's done. And part of that has suffered. If you've been on social media, you've seen some of our uploads have been kind of wonky sometimes too, just because of our work schedules. And it's like, we're not able to even maintain that sometimes too. Nick, like our first days, how much time did we spend pre-show, post-show and production? Like the show might've been 70 minutes that was like the tip of the iceberg of what yeah. actually went into that. And in some cases, when we first got started, all for what, 45, 50 listeners an episode? At, at best. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, it's it's a lot, right? And I think, I mean, there's technical you know, challenges too, because I mean, I still remember right episode one, we were recording out of the KBSC training studio. Uh, that was studio one for us. And... No, it's it's interesting because that, you know, you don't even factor equipment costs, right? We've invested uh, a lot of our own money to do this, a, right? A couple of thousand dollars, yeah, yep, yeah. at least. Yeah. And and I think uh, one thing that I, I think we and I want to make sure we're clear on this: we didn't start the show because of COVID. We actually started it beforehand. Right. Um, when we talk about episode zero, right? So I mean, the idea was already there. And I still recall to this day when COVID happened and again, the uncertainty surrounding COVID, oh, this will be a couple of weeks. Well, okay, this will be something we can do over Zoom or whatever the case may be just to keep our chops fresh. I mean, again, me right. being the broadcast major was a good way to keep talking about things, refining some of the things that I do. And it was a lot longer than a couple of weeks. No, I'll just put it that way. Um, <laughs> yeah, you but, know, and, and it's funny you mentioned what, we've got a couple of clips here. Uh, one of those is episode zero. The other is episode one. But I think the funniest thing to me, I, uh, you know, you're thinking about a lot of startup things, right? Yeah. What do you name your podcast? You know, mm. and, and that was a really difficult thing where I was like, we, we got to call this thing something. And it was more along the lines of what is something catchy that might last a couple of weeks that will get us maybe through the end of the hockey season, just something a little bit fun that was unique, um, had a little bit of branding that, you know, was able to kind of work its way into Husky hockey. Almost was kind of a whim. And I think the the more curious thing about it is, I mean, Nick, we knew each other, but as this clip shows, like we were still kind of in the infancy of learning who we are. And uh, it was it was still me walking past you for a game <laughs> against Alberta going, who the hell is like, I'm scared of this guy. And you are you're like a half a foot taller than me. So I don't know why the hell you'd be scared of me. But well, I mean, I was able to remember your last name. Let's just take a look. <laughs> look at this what is Camp 2. This? The, the one Grand City the Warming House? Okay. Not Grand City Warming House, just the Warming House. Okay, warming sure. House podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And okay. you want to do the Huskies Warming House? Can we, can we do the university affiliation there? We probably could. Yeah, Huskies Warming House. Sure. Or how about Husky Warming House? Singular. Sure. Okay. Yeah. All right. And three, two, one. And welcome to the first ever episode of the Husky Warming House alongside Noah Grant. Is it, Noah, is it Grant or is it Gant? Grant. Yeah, shit. Try again. All right, let's try it again. So, off to a good start. Off to a really good start. All right. And three, two, one. <laughs> and I, I remember being like, you know, because that was my first, like, one of my first real times on camera, too. And I remember, you know, because you, you can tell just by our body posture, we're still kind of in that, like, semi-professional mode, which, as if you've yep. gone through this show, we clearly have gotten away from that. But very much so. <laughs> I mean, in the sense of where I was really nervous, and then it was like, what are we going to call this thing? Oh, okay, we'll do that. We start, who are you again? Like, <laughs> And and I and I think that that was something that just put me at ease is like okay like we're just talking hockey and it and it really is just a natural you know progression of sorts and I you know that's a, a bit of a segment from episode zero we'll touch on that a little bit more uh, coming up here but you know I think people are able to see initially the product that comes out and say oh mm -hmm. this is a new interesting whatever at the peak of our podcast Nick. We were 
the 22nd ranked hockey podcast in North America. And I think that that's something, and people say, well, you know, is, it really, is that really that impressive? And, you know, your top five or ten, it's going to be like 32 Thoughts, Spit and Chicklets, you know, like the, the big, big ones. You've got a lot of... Eight dangle. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. A, a lot of ones that are, uh, you know, related to specific teams. I, I think of our, you know, uh, uh, great friend Seth Topol, you know, in Locked on Wild yep. and the great job that they do and, you know, the Locked on Wild things and stuff. And, um, you know, of course, specific ones, Michael Russo's podcast, everything like that. But... You know, to be able to hit that point where for it was like a two month span, we were getting the viewership that that put us in that category for the the stretch that they out is like it's like every three months they look at it or something like that. That's a big deal when a passion project becomes a lifestyle choice. It becomes something greater. And we've always talked about this show has always been fan driven. We've always you know, done this for our listeners, our viewers. We've always loved the input, the thought process. We, you know, at the end of the day, our viewership is what makes this show happen. Yes. It's fun to talk hockey. We, but you know, we wouldn't have done it for four and a half years if we didn't have a great fan base behind us, Nick. But at the same time, being able to see that reward for something like that and just simply the fan engagement, we'll get to the numbers in a little bit as well too. But Nick, did you kind of feel that there was a point, and I wonder if your point is the same as mine, where the show went from being this fun little startup and something that we thought we could we could try to have a little bit of you know you know interesting time with and and try some new things, to where we were like, holy shit, like we're we're on to something here. It might not be the biggest marquee event that you're going to find, but for a niche podcast, for a specific school, for a very specific sport, we're doing okay here. Yeah, I think it was year two. Absolutely. Honestly. Um, it's when, you know, shall we say the, you know, the this Husky fan aficionados took notice. Mm-hmm. Um, it's when I think... You know, at least for me, Noah, you know, it's it, and I hate to say that it was social media, which now drives pretty much everything that we do. Mm-hmm. And when I say we, I mean, people, not just podcasts or, you know, those of us who are in media, um, the interaction between the fans and, you know, whether it was they were agreeing with something there, they totally disagreed with you, Noah, uh, <laughs> which happened a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or, uh, you know, starting fights uh, over social media. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but it but it did tell us that people are listening and, and they have opinions on the things that we are presenting. And that's great. And, yeah. you know, I think you hit it on the head, right? It wasn't that we were trying to be you know, the, you know, the sign stamp sort of, you know, this is the word of, or the gospel of St. Clair State hockey. That's not from us, right? That's, we don't yeah. get to make, the call. but in other ways, a sort of a guide, right. I, you know, going through the ups and downs mm-hmm. of, you know, yeah, this is great, but also hang on. There's still some things we'd like this team to clean up. Yeah, this is bad, but there are some positives here, you know, trying to always offer, you know, something that we saw, um, you know, it wasn't all great. It wasn't all bad or yeah, nope, that was fantastic or uh, no, this is crap, you know, yeah. just, you know, and, and kind of channeling that emotion, but trying to support it with, as you mentioned, both of us being former players and, and, and you know, with the the way that the game is played, trying to offer just some of the perspective surrounding that storyline. Um, and, and that to me is where it took off for me. It sounds like you would agree that year two was, you know, sort of where we figured, yeah, this, this has got some wheels to it. We got so lucky. And by so lucky, I mean, we were fortunate to be in a situation. The pod was one of the best things that ever happened for our show because it condensed a third of a hockey season into a tight little grouping where we were able to cover it over like a three week period, able to encapsulate that, sit at home, watch the games, kind of plan everything out, be able to do that transition through Ben Holden's leaving CBS, able to naturally bring him into the fold, start talking about Huskies hockey. Ben starts to kind of go on and do his own thing. Huskies go on a national championship game run, right? We have a lot of 
uh, and, and a bit surprising in that sense too, based on the team that they yep. had that year. Getting that excitement, getting to do a live show covering the Frozen Four. You got to fly to Pittsburgh and really, you know, do do our recaps from, you know, PPG Paints Arena. And it's like, you know, when you get to do those things, and then you come up with the amazing brainchild of being able to say, hey, what should we do this summer? Because summer is like death incarnate for a hockey podcast. Yep. What the hell do you do during the summer? Hey, why don't we preview the NCHC teams? Great idea. We started doing it. it. You know, it took two hours each show pre-show to yeah, prepare our a lot team. of prep work and 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 learning how we wanted to do it. And people loved it. They just ate it up. We got so many great new followers and followers from other fan bases who wanted that perspective yeah. just to hear a little bit. You know, we still think about some of these. Uh, you know, people who cover other teams and people who cover other teams that aren't even near where their teams are, are kind of similar to us in some senses as well too and they're sitting and listening to our show they're not a huskies hockey fan you know but they mm-hmm. want to hear that perspective they play the tigers that weekend well tigers fans want to know how we perceive their tigers you know who are up and coming and their transition in our four and a half years has been astronomical but i mean it's like it's fun you know things like that where we were so fortunate in our I would agree year two and year three was truly like the middle portion. It it was truly a bell curve of sorts where we started things off national championship moving into the summer. They had a great third season for the Huskies. And then this year, of course, we kind of made the decision with work and stuff, just moving away. And, you know, the men's team kind of didn't have the year that they wanted. It just kind of a natural progression for us, a, a very true life cycle of sorts. But in those glory days so to speak year two and year three i mean it was just like we're getting guests every week every other week it, you know we're putting out shows like crazy and it, you know it, it didn't feel like work and it matched up with where we were in life and we were passionate enough to do it and it's when i was putting together all the stats for this and looking back and going through i was telling nick pre-show I put together an Excel spreadsheet that had every single one of our guests and a bunch of stats about them and, you know, the minutes down to a T for every single episode that we've done and going through and, oh, I remember that. Oh, I remember that. Oh, I, 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 we did that. I totally forgot about that. You know, wacky things that we did. Nick, you want to know our best named episode? It's episode hmm. 32. It's with Jim Erickson. I titled it Oral Excitement on the Radio, A-U-R-A-L. Aha. Uh-huh. Ridiculous. Yeah. Little things like that where it's like, I... I forgot that I did that. I forgot that we did that. I forgot that, you know, and to be able to look back and think so fondly about that, you know, and it's easy to look through rose colored glasses, you know, the teams of yesteryear that were so good, but the hockey was good. That tension between the fans sometimes was, Oh yeah. (laughs) And tension between us sometimes was enticing to a lot of people too. Like, the more we agreed, the worse it is for us in some senses. Like sometimes that tension is a really good thing and drives a podcast, drives engagement, drives the, the, those pivotal thought provoking discussions where you turn the game of hockey into like this, this religious sermon type of thing. I, I, Nick, do, do you kind of look at it the same way where it was like this progression went from again being something where we started to gain traction to it was like this is a part of us this is like an identity for us and we don't want to make sure that we we stay true to what we do but we also want to explore these new avenues and we'll talk about our identity crisis in some senses because every podcast has one we had we had about seven but being able to go through that kind of transition when things were good and when things maybe were a little bit tense it's almost like we lived through being a college hockey player yeah. for four years. It really is. And the freshmen coming in, there's excitement. You don't know what the hell you're doing, but there's raw talent there. <laughs> you know, um, you're starting to learn systems. You know, you're getting some, you know, fourth line minutes. And, uh, you know, people maybe know your name because it's out there, but you don't. And you, you pay attention from here and there. And then, like you said, second and third, you, you start to figure it out. You're bought in. You're now on the PP unit, maybe a PP number two. Uh, you're getting into the third, second line minutes, right? Uh, but I think the one thing, Noah, that I think is important to note is when the opportunity came, came to adjust, we went in it full bore. I think, yeah. you know, there's certain things if if there are others that are listening to this and are, are asking them, how do I start a podcast? 
I think the question itself is flawed about starting it. I think it's how do you push through yeah. those first 12 to 18, maybe even 24 months, right? Because yeah. um, we, as our podcast, I remember doing Twitter polls, right? You know, do you like this part of the segment? You know, what do you want to see improving from us? And then embracing what the fans wanted to see from us and just going, well, we like this segment. We love talking about the NHL. I remember we stopped doing that this year uh, yeah. just because we did a fan poll and they said, we don't really care to hear about which, that. Which is interesting because from a statistical perspective, as our shows got shorter because we cut that segment out, our viewership actually changed. One of the things we realized as we went through the season, there were a lot of people that actually kind of hung on listening to us talk about the NHL, listening to us talk about the Chicago stuff, some of the kind of the darker, deeper stuff as well, too, where, mm -hmm. you know, we lost that little bit of fan base, too. But then you started to see this influx of people that were like really in tune with the more in-depth dive for Huskies hockey. So like our dynamic changed, you know, as a yep. part of that poll, too. Nick, does it feel like, you know, identity? You're I feel like we were always in a state of identity crisis. And yeah. you had to realize when it was okay to change your lifestyle habits versus when you had to go to therapy. And what yeah. I mean by that is we were always in the spot of, should we continue doing this? Should we change this up? We just started this. We've got to stick with this for X number of time to kind of see how it plays out. We can't switch this up too quick versus being able to say, yeah, this just, this just isn't right. Or you know what? I like this, but but let's switch it this way. What do you think about this? And kind of being able to to make that adjustment. You know, we used to do the two line trivia every week, like you mentioned, Nick. Oh yeah. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. We we don't do that anymore. We haven't done it for a couple of years, partially because I always had to get up on a Saturday and make sure that the the question was up, and then I would always forget because it released at noon, and I had to be on it to make sure I picked the winner. Sometimes I'd be like eating lunch with my parents i'm like oh crap i totally forgot to pick the winner and it's like 12 45 you know and little things like that where it is trial by fire and you're gonna try some shit if you ever start a podcast and you're like well that was a dud and yep. then you'll do other things and you'll be like ah let's just add this little thing in here or whatever and we'll just you know for a couple weeks we'll just add this or whatever and fans will be like this is the most amazing thing you've ever done why did you not do this before and we're like it wasn't even supposed to be a thing <laughs> right. <laughs> it's true. Right. And it's, you know, I, I think your, your, you know, your framework of identity crisis, right. And it's not that we were searching for ourselves per se. I think that's the only thing that I would say that's not quite there, but it's more of like, well, you know, where is the perfect format? Right. Yeah. It, Cause in, at the end of the day, I think in media nowadays, you have to be in a state of identity crisis, right? You can't be stagnant. Yep. You, do, you do have to switch things up. And so to your point, um, although I don't think we necessarily looked at it that way, you know, we were trying to figure out what, as you mentioned with the analytics, the, uh, the statistics going, well, what are people listening to? What are they not? Um, and again, being okay with, even though I know that there were times where we loved it, you know, a segment on the episodes we were producing, but nobody was listening to it. So we were yeah. like, we, we got to make a change. Right. Um, or and, you know, we hate and, talking about this and it's the best thing that's getting the ratings. Well, yeah, it, absolutely. The counterpoint is, I mean, we've had some segments, we did a 15 minute segment and we're like, ah, you know, like we kind of bickered about that and it was whatever. And it didn't really matter. And you look at the engagement and you're like, oh my God. And then, so if you're doing the YouTube channel you can see exactly where the engagement is i can you know i can look at where my you know the, the viewers are you know right in that cluster what's their most watched portion where is it at how long are they sticking around and you look at this little segment that we'd be talking about like you know how can women's volleyball influence this whatever blah 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 that had nothing to do with hockey and it's like people are just eating it up and you're like what it's yeah. like it's like we just spent 35 <laughs> minutes talking about how the Huskies cream Duluth and it's like our most most hit segment is us talking about some scandal that happened with some GM and whatever like you know it you know so it, it really you when you talk about the flexibility you have to be receptive to the fact that what drives your engagement in your content and we learn this is not what you think it is no at its base, at its core, the Huskies Warming House podcast, it's St. Cloud Hockey. It's the men's yep. and women's hockey team. And us just loving to talk about the game because we went to St. Cloud. 
but it became so much more than that because listeners and viewers drove our kit. They told us based on the way they engaged with us, what they wanted, what they liked, what they didn't like. And you have to be perceptive and you have to be willing to capitalize on that opportunity without distorting what your true like identity really is your your true base intent with the show is you know if we started the show and we start talking about huskies hockey and we go okay well we're going to stop covering the huskies and now we're going to talk about the minnesota wild like that, that that gets away from the root of what we wanted this show to be but if we start talking about the wild and saying you know jack pierce a guy who's looking to go to minnesota and the wild are doing xyz what, what's interesting about this then you start to pull all these conspiracy spider webs quote unquote together and formulate a well-rounded show i don't know if we're well well well-rounded nick but we've certainly changed from where we've been i think it's kind of interesting uh our first episode that actually aired episode one we sat down in kvsc studio what do you think we take a listen and uh see how things sounded uh fun fact nick as you like to allude to us I was so gun shy on the mic that you were the definite host of this show. What the hell yep. kind of a monster did you turn me into? Uh, I don't know, but you were listening to the wrong person. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> well, <laughs> let's listen to two of the wrong people. Episode one. And now Micah Miller trying to spring a pass ahead. Nobody in front of Jack Paling moves on with a blast and score. Giving up on chances, and we just gotta bottom line execute. Wait, wait, pass the front, great save, Pelosi, as she robs a gopher in front of her, and that was number eight, Kippen Keller, on the great A opportunity. For me as a coach, that's the kind of D you're always looking for, because uh, they don't grow on trees for sure, and, and he's done a really good job being a captain of a really young team this year. It's a really cool thing to see for them to uh, really appreciate what I've done on and off the ice. To the far half wall, Jack Paling. Trying to play it into the corner. Now Paling turns, squares his body to the slot, sends it up high toward Jack. And Sean makes his play through and they score! Right along the blue line, Nick Paling was in front of the net and St. Cloud State's got a lead. And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Huskies Warming House podcast. I'm your host, Nick Maxson, alongside Noah Grant, and we'll be taking you through the world of hockey here in the Granite City area. Noah, it's mid-February now, and certainly as we wrap things around with college hockey, especially here in the uh, Granite City area, St. Cloud State University, getting close to playoff time. And uh, that's going to be one of the main topics of both of the men's and women's teams here as we uh, approach some of our segments. But to lead off, we need to talk about the men's team and their weekend trip into Colorado Springs against the Tigers. Some big conference points on the line. And I think we need to talk about how four to six points wasn't what they wanted was all six, but still four to six points is still a pretty good result. Yeah, absolutely. You'll take that. And I mean, when I got a chance to talk with Brett Larson, I think where that really started was actually the Miami series the weekend prior, because you remember in Western Michigan, they got their doors blown off. I mean, there's no way to put it, you know, really tough first periods and first periods that they really didn't play that bad, but I mean, just could not buy a bounce and Western Michigan's a tough place to play. You come back home you match up against Miami you're looking to gain some traction especially that was a, essentially could have been a 12 point weekend and it ended up being one against Miami because they were a team that were kind of right on St. Cloud's heels as far as trying to chase them up in the standings they're able to build probably their strongest weekend of the year and at home in front of fans too um, arguably maybe the Duluth series was you know could have could have rivaled that one but to be able to translate that into following up success with success is what brett larson had mentioned and going into cc and a pretty gutsy win on friday night jack ashan is able to tally you know the game winner in overtime and it's just awesome to see that they finally are able to put a string of games together not only three games in a row but games on the road 
too. And I think there were a little bit of, you know, fans that weren't happy necessarily with the overall play on Saturday. But, I mean, to go to a shootout, Jack Ashan gets his, you know, hits the century mark with his 100th point. I think that, you know, it's a really good start for this team that, uh, you know, when you're moving into March hockey, the play that matters the most, that's, that's imperative. And you have to have a team that shows resiliency especially on the road and you talk about going into Colorado College we know that that's a team that's been struggling they are ranked eight here in the NCHE conference uh, started off pretty promising for this season I know when they came into Herb Brooks National Hockey Center they swept the Huskies I mean first of all I have no idea what the hell I was talking about. I still don't, but I mean, I definitely have no idea what I was talking about. Um, also weird to think about the CC Tigers being eighth in the NCHC. What the year they also swept the Huskies in this building. But I, I think that just looking back on that, Nick, and knowing that, you know, we had such small ambitions and intentions. And I, I think that the progression was just so natural for us in terms of, the excitement and being able to be a little bit subdued at times too, to be able to think, Oh, we, we want to do this. So we want to try to do this. And it's, you know, other avenues saying, yeah, no, 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 no. Like that, that's not how this thing works. And being able to kind of put the time in and learn and refine the craft from being a little bit raw into, you know, being into that next perspective. We'll take a look at episode zero. We both look a lot younger and a lot different than we do now. (laughs) But uh, yeah, I, I, I just think, yeah. Any thoughts about episode number one? Oh my gosh! How jumpy are you? <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. I was oh I was very very Mike shy. I you know which is yeah. What again? What happened? But and I think even for me, you know, it's it came to a point where it, as the show kept going, right? Um, I sort of took off. What do you want to call it? Like almost a performance hat in a degree? Or like an expectation that it needed to be this refined perfect masterpiece. And I think that we learned that again, we talked about the engagement. We learned that sometimes the more raw and relaxed and unfiltered we were, the more people seemed to gravitate to it. And it made it easier to be like, you know, as most podcasts do, especially those who haven't gotten to that commercial side of things. It's more like having a beer with your buddies and talking shop, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's kind of what it ultimately ended up being is we started with this big professional radio show ambition type of thing. And then it was more like... Brought to you by... Yeah, the the soda pod (laughs) and Sunrise View. But I mean, it's... um, but, and again, can't say enough about Bill Prout and Sunrise View and the upstart Mm -hmm. that we had, especially when we were working remote. But being able to you know, be comfortable with it, the fact that it, it can just be two guys talking hockey. As long as you have a format that's polished enough where listeners can expect some sort of routine and can follow it from tip to tail, if you're not switching that up too much, the content's going to drive itself. And mm-hmm. I don't know if we did that or not, Nick, but we certainly tried our best. And I think, you know, Probably the the easiest way to take a look at this is why don't we just take a look at the you know the final stats here? I, I mean, there's a lot of staggering things that I think kind of came out of this that I really didn't realize until I took a look at some of these things. Nick, any idea in in terms of minutes, our longest show length? Any idea? It's close to two hours. I know that. Kind of ish. Um, yeah. Uh, Hour forty five. In terms of minutes, see, see, this is this is why oh, our so you're making me do math. This you is know, okay. this is why our show d- didn't succeed, Nick, is because we can't do uh, math. <laughs> and no, you're just being a stubborn little ass. Make me do it in minutes. 120 minutes is two hours. In case anyone was curious, <laughs> I, I think they can do 60 times two, but maybe you don't. I can, don't know. Can they? Um, the, let's I, do. Hey, we we may have some North Dakota fans here, so we'll slow it down for them. That's fair. Um, 110. We'll put it that way. 129 is the answer. Any idea? It was two hours. Okay. Any idea the shortest show? This is not counting specials. So any announcements or like we did a we did a repackage of a couple interviews that was like three hours long one time. I think 33 minutes. You're very close. 34 minutes. Um, both of them. I win the showcase. <laughs> both of them happen to actually be interviews. 
Um, episode 39 is our longest. We had 129 minutes. We had two clock in at 128 as well, too. So we've had three fairly longest shows that have extended beyond two hours. Our shortest show was episode 45 was an interview as well. Uh, Nick, the longest show, um, by the way, Nick can't see these graphics. So if you're wondering, well, he can clearly see he actually can't. So, uh, Nick, any idea? It was a pair of guests for episode 39. Any idea who was our longest episode ever? Mm. Two. Uh, it was a current player and a former player at that time, early on in show history. Again, episode 39, not even a year second. in. A little around Thanksgiving holiday. I'm completely stumped. Jack Sean and Jimmy Schultz, actually, oh, is, our lo- is our longest show. Um, our shortest in episode 45 um, was someone who has had a very storied career in the National Hockey League. Any idea? That would be Dowd, right? It's actually Brett Hedekin. Uh, partially because he basically said you got about half an hour, <laughs> you know. So um, from tip to tail is pretty pretty much about 28, 29 minutes for the the interview, and then you know in and out for each. So yeah, kind of an interesting little caveat, uh, Nick. Let's talk a little bit of guest numbers here as well too, because of course we've had a fair number of guests on this show, over one hundred total guest appearances, seventy nine of them being unique guests on this show. So. Um, 56 of them have been male, 23 have been female, 38 have been players, 12 have been coaches, and 29 have been media or alumni that have extended well beyond their Huskies careers, per se. Not a lot of overlap with that. I mean, you had, like, I looked at Don Lucia as still a coach. I mean, even though he's a commissioner, I mean, in my mind, he I mean, he was a coach for over two decades, right? So, um, but yeah, kind of an interesting little caveat, you know almost 80 unique guests on this show you think about that you know we have almost 250 episodes 80 of those you know had a guest in some form so kind of an interesting interesting little caveat here so nick speaking of our guests we have one guest that takes the cake in terms of most appearances on the show we have someone in Mm -hmm. sole possession of second place and we have three that are tied for our third place spot on the show can you name them? Brett Larson is number one. Yep. How many? Appe- how many? Yep. Ben Holden is number two. You're correct. Any idea how many appearances for each of those guys? Brett was like four or five. Okay. Five. You're, I'll, you're, I'll, I'll, you're let, I'll let I'll let you know when we put the when we put the graphic up. What about okay. for Ben? Uh, three. Okay. And then who are our last three that are in a three way tie? Everybody else had two appearances or less. So. Oof. Um, hang on a second. <laughs> Kevin Fitzgerald? Nope. He only had two appearances. Okay, so that means I'm wrong on the other ones. Uh, he, was, he was definitely in our DMs. Were you thinking Tyler Anderson or Nolan Walker, too? I figured they were in your probably. That was part of it, yeah. Um, I'm trying to remember. No, I think we only had Nick Oliver once. Um Nick Oliver twice. Uh, we had him once alone and once with Luke Jaycox actually before the Frozen oh, Four. Right. Um, the answers may surprise you. Let's uh, let's take a look at our top five guests all time. Brett Larson is the correct answer. Eight appearances for Brett Larson on this show. Uh, ben Holden four times. Bill Prout center ice view three appearances oh, yeah. for him. Dave Shyak also with three, and then Pat Micheletti. Mm-hmm. Is our other Dave Shyak is kind of a sneaky one because we we interviewed him early when he That's was right. first coming to be a part of the Huskies and then we had a tandem interview with him and then of course we talked at Thanksgiving about his his wine preferences very unique right. interview uh, in year number one so kind of an interesting caveat eight appearances for Brett Larson Nick in one of the years he joined us right after the season in April and then came and joined us again at the beginning of June less than um, two months later. Mm-hmm. So again, can't say enough about Brett Larson, who of course his last appearance on this show here today. So I uh, just yeah can't say enough about him and how gracious and cordial he's been with us. So uh, Nick, let's get into some of the bigger numbers here. Uh, total show time. Um, oh boy, I'll, I'll have you guess why not. In terms of minutes, 
How many minutes of showtime, or I guess you can do hours. How many minutes and or hours of showtime do we have? 2,235. <laughs> Nick, you're a little off. I hate to break it to you. You ready? Okay. 19,279 minutes. I definitely did my math wrong. Okay. <laughs> Three, 321 hours, which is just under 13 and a half straight days of episode release time. If you, uh -huh. if you listen to us nonstop, it would take you two weeks straight to get through our show. Sounds like a torture chamber. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like putting the direct TV help channel on for, <laughs> <No kidding. laughs> for 24 hours, 247 episodes across that time. Let's talk about totals by, uh, by year here. Now, uh, lifetime average, um, Nick can't see this, Nick average show length in terms of minutes. What's our average show time? So how, you know, 75 minutes. Oh, very close. 78 minutes. Well done. 2020. I, uh, again, so I did episodes by year and for the first year it shortened because we started a little bit yep. late. And then for the rest of the years, minus this year, I did out of 51 weeks because it was expected that we were going to take at least a week off for Christmas. So 2020, 45 episodes, including episode zero, which was never released. So It'd be 96% otherwise, but 98% of our weeks had a show. Yep. Average length of 87 minutes, 2021. Out of 51 weeks, Nick, 87 shows. Jesus. 171% conversion rate, 67 minutes average length. A lot of interviews in 2021. That's where we talked about year number two started to really hum along for us uh 2022 uh 51 out of 51 that's 100 percent. even nick maxson or a north dakota fan can do that math uh average length this is our longest average length of any year 91 minutes so we averaged an hour and a half throughout that year that was a lot of content related to uh, i believe nchc previews yep uh as well as a lot of uh crazy things going on in the NHL world uh, and being able to yeah. talk about the wild as well. Last year, 49 out of 51 weeks, 96% average length of 82 minutes. And this year, 15 out of 16 weeks, not including today, 94% average length of 59 minutes. The show has really been cut down uh, in this last year. So Nick, 98%, 171, 196, 94%. Pretty much every week and then some. In the last four and a half years, the Huskies Warming House podcast has been with you listeners and viewers. I just, again, when we talk about time dedication, those almost 20,000 minutes, that's just what you're seeing as the final finished product. So put that into perspective here. It's been a fantastic time here on the Huskies Warming House podcast. A couple more stats graphics to get through here because you know how I work, Nick. Um, two, I'll more. Just be here. <laughs> two more. Two <laughs> more. Uh, Number of games covered, Nick, this is a general estimate over a nice big round three digit number over how many games do you think that we've covered in show history over four and a half years? 200. Well, Nick, by my math, I've got probably close to 600 games that we've touched in some capacity. The Wild, three seasons at oh, least, right. so over 260 there. Uh, men's hockey, about 150, same for the women. You're thinking about 30, 30 I'm games. I'm thinking about, yeah. Yeah, 30 games. And then I would say the NCAAs, the World Juniors, some high school stuff. I'd say there's where your extra 40. So I'd say about 600 games we've probably covered sense. on this show. But, Nick, what everyone wants to know, the big number, downloads, audio views, listens. Nick, by the time this show is done and a couple of other things that we have yet to talk about here at the tail end of this show, Almost 70,000 downloads, audio listens, or views. That's just under 300 per episode, which to me is just astounding. And even more astounding to me, we had a quote-unquote down year in our last year here. In our first year, we were averaging maybe 45 to 50 listeners for probably the first 35 shows before we really started to gain traction when the pod got ramped up at the end of 2020. So you think about that cluster, probably close to 
50,000, 55,000 of those listens were in a three year span. Mm -hmm. Does it feel like we did something that great? I don't know if it does, but it feels like we sure as hell did something. I think it means that we persisted yeah, more than anything. And like we talked about before, no, it's, it's a game of cat and mouse in a sense. And it's a game of cat and mouse within yourself. Yeah. Really. Right. Um, we're not going to call ourselves the Dave Carl of, uh, you know, mid game adjustments because he's the king of that. <laughs> but, um, you know, I do think that it does speak to how the, there was, it's, Let's, let's keep with the coaches talk, right? It's the, per, you know, the, and the willingness to go in the corners and, and battle it, right? Because, you know, like you mentioned, there's internal battles within ourselves that, and with each other at times and with the fan base per se, with other fan bases, sorry, North Dakota, not really, but, um, <laughs> but, you know, it's, you, it's, it's knowing what you're getting into and still willingness to go in there and do it. Right. Yeah. Um, and I think what that symbolizes more than anything is not that we were great. I think we were, let's put it that way. I think it's been a great run, but it also means more than that. It means that, you know, you know, just kind of like how we talked about Denver winning the national championship. It's knowing that you're going to get probably 60 shot attempts in the third period and you got to go out and block 40 of those. Yeah. It's going to sting. It's going to hurt. But you won't be able to feel a darn thing when you're raising the national championship trophy, right? And I think that's really more what that speaks to. And I think the interesting part about this, too, it kind of walks through our life a little bit. You and I have changed jobs. I finished an entire college degree during this time in addition to the one that I was in previously when we started this show. I went from being in St. Cloud, to living at my parents' place, to getting an apartment, to getting another apartment. I've lived in four different locations since we started this show. Nick, we've talked about your plethora of opportunities that you've had as well, too. And I think that that's kind of the thing that sticks out is when I think about our show history, it's also a moment in our lives. It's a moment in time. Mm -hmm. I can remember where, where we were when we had some of our big marquee guests, you know, when we were first learning about, you know, how to do some of these things and trying to make things happen. You know, we've had some really great highs, some really fun, awesome guests. Um, we've had some guests that we, you know, we've gotten done and we're like, ah, maybe they weren't the strongest, all things considered. But, you know, those things happen here and there, you know, where not everybody's, uh, you know, a, a media personality. Yeah, not, <laughs> not, not that talkative uh, all the time, but uh, or they're calling in from a, you know, a sat phone and a, a late cabin in the middle of nowhere. But <laughs> um, but, uh, shout out Jeff, <laughs> shout out Jeff Passolt episode 30, but, uh, um, you know, on the flip side of that too, we've had some moments as well, you know, where we've thought, gosh, we might not have a show next week, or I don't know what we're going to do in a month or how are we going to do this? You know, in times where, when you're going things through things in life too, you just wonder, can you keep doing this for the next month? Mm -hmm. uh, I'd say each of us, Nick, has probably had about four or five of those moments in show history. Some together, some separate. We're like, dude, like, I don't know. And mm -hmm. going from that moment, you know, and we talked about the excitement, the energy, the drive to have to want to kind of push the envelope a little bit into getting to the point where, as I asked you, was there a moment where you realized that this show is taking off? Is your moment the same as mine where you realize that we might be headed toward the natural progression of, I think the Huskies Warming House podcast might be done after this year? I don't know if there was one singular moment, Noah. You know, and I think similar to a player, right? When you're, you're on the ice and whether it's reduced ice time here, not playing on the power play, you're not getting penalty kill minutes. Um, just knowing you're not the fastest skater. And at the end of the day, I think there is a culmination of those things, right? Where I think yeah. for us personally, it's, as you mentioned, career changing things, maybe more so um, for us, maybe more intimately career advancement type things. Yeah. And, you know, go, kind of going back to some of our earlier discussions, right? This takes a lot of work. It takes dedication. And I think 
to answer it the best, I, I think when you put not what we have done, but more so what we needed to do and what the priorities were going to be, right? Yeah. I think that the priority um, the level changes, right? And I think the one thing we came to a conclusion organically, as you mentioned, is you mentioned a bell curve earlier, but I really think you want it to be half of one, right? You, you want to see it go up. Right. And if something is going to end, you want to leave it at that point, right? You don't want it to be a plane that's going at Mach 1 and then all of a sudden running out of fuel. Last I checked physics-wise, that doesn't end very pretty. So, um, <laughs> but at the end of the day, uh, that's, I think that's where it came through. I think we realized what we needed to do, the energy, the fuel that was required to keep this thing going. And it's not that we didn't have it, but we, we made the decision that to keep it going was going to use more energy. And I think to kind of bring a sort of a financial or more of an economic kind of twist to this inflation was growing yeah. our, you know, our dedications outside of the podcasts were getting more demanding and there was a conscious decision to go either we're going to let this thing crash and burn or we have to divert and we have to land this thing. But by doing so we'll land with ourselves fully intact and more so leave a better legacy of what we had accomplished to this point rather than trying to burn ourselves out right and more so crash and burn in a way that i think more you know more importantly for us no and i'll have you comment on this is to potentially destroy everything that we worked so hard to get to this point well exactly going out on our own terms i think was important and also, we mentioned it earlier, being able to dedicate ourselves to the craft a little bit. It's not that we don't have the energy to do it. It's not that we don't want to do it. We love doing what we do. Um, we very much could have used a third person. I think if we had a producer yeah. or an editor, I think that would would have made a big difference. But we were at that point where we had done everything by ourselves. We knew the routine. We knew the product. We just We had grown in that capacity. But at the same time, we wanted to maintain that standard, like you said, Nick. And people say, well, you know, you do all these graphics, you do all this and that, and yes, you can you can push a little bit more sometimes, you can cut back a little bit more sometimes, but, you know, oh, to put a show, you've got to do this and this or whatever. There's only so many hours in a week. It's mm -hmm. not the singular shows that are the challenge. Yep. It's, we just went back to our records almost every week, we've had a show for four and a half years. And throughout the middle of our show we had two shows a week and throughout the high point of our show we had two shows a week plus two game recaps to three game recaps during the the tournaments and whatever else mm -hmm. at the end of that so to maintain that week after week after week we've had some times too where we've had to change recording times and this past year has been especially difficult you know with my work schedule as a nurse that really changes my obligation with a school schedule a little bit easier to kind of move in and out and be able to have a more natural schedule think about what for two and a half years nick we did this show every sunday morning 8 a.m yeah every sunday morning 8 sometimes saturday night yeah. um or sunday night after i got off working yeah. my second slash third job at midnight yeah and yeah. being able to be dedicated to that, you know, Brett Larson, we love him. Besides the past couple of episodes, you know what Brett Larson's preferred interview time is? It's like Monday morning at 6 a.m. Yep. You know, so to be able to have to match that, you know, I was going to school working two jobs. Nick, you had two to three jobs at that point. You were finishing your broadcasting career through the first half of our show as well, too. These are the decision for lack of a better term, was extremely challenging because it was yep. never something that we wanted to do. But we knew that if we were going to do it, we wanted to do it on our terms. We wanted yep. to do it right. And we wanted to give it the time that it deserved. And I don't know if we've done that, but I feel satisfied with that. I feel at peace walking away from this, knowing that this was something that whether people want to admit it or not, it touched lives. 
And that sounds yep. cheesy as hell. But I think about when we first started and we were one of the first kind of audio podcasts to get up and running and, you know, guest on our show as well too, in a very difficult time talking about, you know, the Mac Motsko situation, uh, or, you know, the Rink Lives, uh, Mick Hatton, what he's done with the Rink Live, you know, they added their own podcast platform. Our former colleague, colleague in Sid Wolf, looking what she's been able to do with the Rink Live, creating those opportunities, thinking about guys like Sam Getzinger, who's doing the North Dakota High School Hockey State Tournaments, doing all these tournaments all over. Uh, Blake Tyson, his opportunities. Uh, you know, Joey Erickson, thinking about he's doing Locked On, you know, Dallas Stars and stuff like that. Uh, you know, Drew Steele and his great chances in the USHL as well, too. Thinking about all these people that we've come in contact, that we've seen them kind of interwoven with our show history as well, too. Too, and not to mention, you know, of course, Center Ice View, the plethora of great media guests that we've had, you know, Ben Holden, Dave Starman, guys like that. Being able to be a part of someone's life, for some of you, it's been every week. For mm-hmm. some of you, it's been occasionally. For others, unless Brett Larson's on, you're not visiting. That's okay. We've loved every minute of having each and, one, each and every one of our listeners and viewers here through that process. So that decision, I think, carried the most weight of we knew it was coming. We knew how we wanted to do it. I think, Nick, you and I would agree that we probably got about a third of the way into this season, probably about Thanksgiving time. And we're like, "Mm, I don't know. You know, I, I don't know that we can maintain the standard and we don't want to hit a point where we can't. And it's not that we couldn't maintain the standard. It's just that it would require more capacity of us in relation to the other things in our life. We want to leave you with a product that you enjoyed for four and a half years from tip to tail that maintained that integrity for that entire time. And uh, yeah, Nick, it's, it's a freaking bittersweet decision. Um, Is is it just hitting us now? I think it's hitting us right now. I think so. Um, And and here's the irony of the situation. We never really talked about it. No. And that's the thing that's kind of weird. It's, you know, it's not like the couple who gets into a fight and says, okay, yep, yeah, we, we talked about this. I screwed up. You screwed up. Okay. And everything's fine. Right. Or, or in our case, Noah, you screwed up. Here's why let's talk, but you know, <laughs> mind you, the one saying that was yourself. You're talking in the mirror. No, <laughs> no, but I, I think at the end of it, you know, we talk about energy and, and more so, but I think even the core fundamental to us Noah, is that when we do something as people, we don't go less than a hundred percent. And I think really that's what sets the tone for both of us and our personal lives and our professional lives is we don't want to, for lack of a better phrase, half asset. Yep. Right. And so being that it's been four and a half years and being that it has been at times very tiring, trying to balance everything else that we have going on outside of the podcast, which is a lot. This past weekend covered the, I worked from eight o'clock in the morning until three on Thursday, then drove to St. Paul to cover two frozen four games was there till like one, two o'clock in the morning. The next day I was up at working at eight o'clock till basically four I had to lie down by fly. I mean, you drive very fast <laughs> down to Austin, Minnesota to call a junior hockey game. Yep. Drive all the way back. Right. I'm not getting back in the building till midnight. And then again, work on Saturday morning, go to the frozen four again to cover that. And on Sunday, you you love what happened, but you are flat out exhausted. And I think, and by saying this story, Noah, it explains that we, the conversation wasn't that we need to talk about the podcast. It was, we were both walking to the door, almost like back in our 21 to 22 year old selves, which mind you between us is about a decade apart. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But basically, you know, that Saturday night where you lay on the couch and go, I don't know if I can continue to do this. Yeah. And I think it, that's really what it was. It wasn't a, a direct, like addressing of the situation. It was, I think we both realized we're running out of gas. It was mutually understood. And yeah. I, you know, I, it was very, I, I'm going to be honest when we, um, I think we sat down for one of the shows that might've been like, it was in the one nineties, some, somewhere at like one ninety four, one ninety five, And I think I sat down and I was like, you know, I was like, I think at the end of the year, I think it probably makes sense for us to be done. And you just looked at me and you said, I agree. We'll plan for it. 
I, I mean, that that was it. That was and, it. And it was just like we we both just were at that point where it's like we just knew. And we knew that we were going to be moving on to different things. As you mentioned, you mentioned three days in your timeline, right? I've been working night shift at the hospital. I work for 13 hours. I come home. I sleep. I do it over again. And we've done a lot of these shows that we've done. I'm in the middle of working four, four days in a row in that stretch. And I wake up at 445, which if you're on the night shift... 4:45 in the afternoon is 4:45 in the morning for me before a 7 a.m. job and we do you know we do a show for an hour and it's like we've been so dedicated to doing that it's time for us to pursue other avenues more intently things that we're excited about personally and professionally more family time as well too and just being able to do that cuz you think about you just mentioned half a week you got to throw a show in there somewhere and the way the yeah. ho- the way the hockey world works all the games are on the weekends so you want to yep. make sure that you package up a product during that time and get it out before the next weekend starts so it's it's been a hell of a ride it's just been incredible the way that we've been able to go through things you mentioned us being a little bit young we do have two more tidbits in show history left to come out we're excited about those and mm-hmm. We'll we'll touch on them in just half a second, but you talk about show history. There is something that might be coming out in the coming weeks before we're all said and done, and by might, we're going to make it happen. There's an episode that none of you guys have ever seen. Nope. We call it episode zero. We look a little bit younger, a little bit more raw in our infancy days. You might see a bit more of this coming out, but here's a couple of minutes. And welcome to the first ever episode of the Husky Warming House alongside Noah Grant. I'm Nick Max, and for those of you just joining the show here again, first ever episode, this is a show where we talk everything and anything hockey from here in the Grand City for the Huskies men's and women's teams. We'll expand on the NCNC conference as a whole, and then also get into some more topics outside of college hockey, into the NHL, and also into some local high school teams. But I think, Noah, the first topic we're going to discuss today is going to be the Huskies men's team who came away with a big sweep against the University of Minnesota Duluth, getting back-to-back wins for the first time since the Miami series in Ohio. A huge win for this team uh, from this last weekend. Yeah, absolutely. They're a team, of course, that you you look at them with a 2-1 to win on Friday and a 2 to nothing win on Saturday, and just really strong to see them finally be able to put it together, like you said, with the Miami series. They get the job done, almost get the job done against Omaha as well, just weren't quite able to eke it out with an overtime loss on that Saturday at home, but they're really trending in the right direction, especially in the NCAC. Unfortunately, the thing that's burning them right now is their start, of course, against non-conference play. does put them in a tough spot for the NCAA tournament, but going back to this weekend, they were a team that really played strong defensively, especially on Friday night. They had five penalties to kill off, and they were able to get the job done, and just really nice to see them steal a game with David Rennick on Friday and then Saturday a late finish with a minute 25 left to play. A great tip by Nick Paling, a shot coming from Jack Ashan, the captain and the Hobie Baker candidate out there for the Huskies team. Um, As we switch gears to this upcoming series against Western Michigan obviously any NCAC conference uh, weekend series is going to be huge but the Huskies only trail Western Michigan currently sitting in fourth place in the standings by four points so two big wins could put them in a home ice position coming NCHC playoff time. Yeah, home ice is obviously imperative as we look moving into February and March hockey of course, like we just mentioned, the Huskies are probably going to have to win the NCHC tournament to get the job done. Going to have to probably go through either in North Dakota or at Denver. It's going to be extremely challenging. One of the ways to make that job a little bit easier is playing on your home ice and Western Michigan is going to be the matchup that they have this weekend coached by NHLer Andy Murray, former NHL coach I should say. And uh, they're a team with a lot of speed and it's going to be important to stay disciplined. When I talk to Brett Larson just moments ago, he mentioned how their team was not disciplined on Friday against Duluth, and it almost bit them. They were able to stay strong defensively, and then Saturday, they turned the tide. They were the aggressive. They were the team that uh, was on the power play and got those late opportunities, and Jack and Sean, Nick Paling, what more can you say? Shocker. I continue to talk along <laughs> in this clip as well, too. But, uh, yeah, first of all, it, we look totally different, but I uh, I, I think that some of us look better than the other. I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's 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 a, it's a low bar, but I mean, I, I I think that when you get to kind of walk through that and you look back and you think, holy shit, like that's what we came from. First of all, 
still looks incredible, holds up. We realize very quickly after doing that episode that it would take us about seven or eight hours per show to be able to upload it each time and package it. Yeah, yeah just not going to no. happen. Um, but it was without help, I should say, because we we when we originally yeah. planned for that, we had uh, other members of UTVS at St. Cloud State uh, mentioned they would help. And then uh, funny, come to game time and then it's just me and you. <laughs> Yeah, and, and the and, multiple and, carts of three camera kits, the lighting oh, kit, yeah. the microphones. It probably took us what, just an hour, just to truck everything on, from the on, studio and back and set up and, and take down on a windy, snowy day. And for those who have walked from, is it Holland, not for, or below Holland, back basically towards the rink, and you go all the way towards where all the cameras are stored. I mean, just walking normally, it's a good 10, 12 minute walk, and it's. It's downhill when you're going there, but then when you go back from the rink to bring everything back, it's uphill the entire way. Yeah. <laughs> Just not feasible. But Nick, I, I think one of the things that I'm really excited about, um, I kind of just brought it up today to Nick, so we're going to try to package it up and do it as best as we can. None of you guys have seen episode zero. And as I mentioned to Nick, after we release our little announcement next week, it's going to bug me that we're at 249 total episodes. I'd love for our Typical. listeners and viewers to kind of see our show come full circle and see the never before seen episode zero. I don't know how relevant and pertinent the information is going to be. I think there was a lot of Matt Dumba trade talk at that time, which, hey, Arizona, was. Arizona Coyotes, full circle. But uh, okay. um, we'd love for our listeners and viewers to hear it. So I would say maybe in a week or two's time. Episode zero, I think, is going to be headed out, and that will be the last thing you see from the Huskies Warming House podcast. As we mentioned, Nick, in a little bit, probably in a couple days, maybe in a week or so, we will release just a short couple-minute uh, piece encapsulating some things to look forward to where you can find the Huskies Warming House, kind of just a couple things that we'll be up to and where you can find us. You know, We'd love to still hear from our listeners and viewers. Uh, it's been an incredible ride, Nick, uh, to be a part of this, and uh, um, excited to kind of go through those final little steps here on the Huskies Warming House podcast. We've had some gigantic leaps and uh, some little baby steps at times, but overall it's been an incredible journey through almost essentially five years. Uh, if you want to go pre-show when we first started working together in 2019, but uh, Nick, I guess for the last time on the Huskies Warming House podcast, anything you got to add? Uh, thank you. Um, I still remember when, uh, I was setting up at KBSC and it was supposed to be about a 10 minute pregame turned into 30 minutes. Um, and just, it was just the hockey talk. And I just remember, I believe it was a like game number two, if I recall, because we had talked about game number one and just some of the things that the Huskies were doing and just some of the breakouts. I think you mentioned, oh yeah, this person's got to be here. And oh yeah, you just chimed in and said, yeah, that's just got to go off the glass. And now we both looked at each other and went, yeah, we're in the same we're in the same language, we right? Just, this guy we, gets okay. it. Yeah. And then <laughs> the pregame happened, and I still remember Joel McMullen was not happy with the length. <laughs> but uh at the end of it, I think I just knew then that okay. Okay. I get we got someone that speaks the the hockey lingo, as I say. And you know, outside Canada, that's kind of hard to find naturally. <laughs> so uh <laughs> and, and outside of Minnesota, it's even harder. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Unless you go to Massachusetts, um, the state of hockey. And then, you know, as you mentioned, calling games together and just, you know, I still remember even if you weren't on the broadcast, you know, there were times I think even an icing call and, uh, you know, a couple of players were trying to hide in the bench. I still remember, you know, you looking over in press row and pointing down and, you know, within the exact same moment you pointed, I mentioned that this is a little bit of gamesmanship and, you know, just the smile on your face, like, yep, I, you, yep. you nailed exactly what I was looking at. And it really... Kind of came from there and even just sometimes I was on the audio board for a Kahar show. Uh, we were doing the basketball uh, games there and we would come in and we would still chat. And then the idea sort of formed uh, and then we got to push comes to shove and we got to, again, episode zero. Um, and here we are four and a half, almost five years later. And it's been a hell of a ride. It really has. And um, I wouldn't take back a thing for a second. Um I would do it all over again in a heartbeat as long as there was a paycheck. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we need to figure out how to get paid next right, time. Right. Yeah, yes. exactly. Right. 
Um, you know, and maybe that's another thing pe- people don't know. We we never made a cent from this. Yeah. In fact, we're we're in the red by a lot, actually. Yeah. And, not, <laughs> and, and, not, and not just uh, cardinal red. Uh, definitely yeah. financial. It's <laughs> uh, it's uh, well, God, what's a good dark shade of red like cranberry red or what? Like, listen, I got too many patients with GI problems. I don't want to think about any shades of red at this point. <laughs> but... <laughs> It's uh, it's Iron Man red. It's it's down it's down there, but uh, but no, seriously. Um, and I think also a thank you to the fans. Yes. Uh, thank you to this uh, to the university. Thank you to uh, both men's and women's hockey programs. Every coach, every player, um, those that we've had on the show, those that have not, um, uh, just for making this whole thing possible. Um, SID Zandra Melro, Tom Nelson, going back a little oh, yeah. bit. Um, all of the game day staff up there at the Herbrooks National Hockey Center that always treated us with courtesy, you know, whether it was working game days for me on television, um, as well as KVSC, um, you know, for really getting the spark going and helping us maintain that vision. Um, we couldn't have done that without you again. You know, it, it takes a team uh, behind the scenes. I know that our team know it's a little bit different per se. Um, we still have those people to thank for helping this thing continue to trek on the way that it has. Yeah. And a lot of the players and coaches too, I think in the early years, you know, your Nolan Walker's Tyler Anderson's Kevin Fitzgerald's guys were able to set up interviews with us early Johnny on. Johnny Appleseed. Yep. Yeah. And, be, <laughs> and, and being able to be a part of those things and, you know, and, and be people being patient with us too. I mean, there were a fair amount of people. I mean, we, we pissed off a lot of people too. You know, it was kind of part of, and me a little bit more than you, but I mean, being, being a part of that and being able to navigate You had that. the Twitter handle. So yeah, sometimes uh, you, the enter button went before the edit button. Well, I, I, I suppose, <laughs> uh, I suppose when I made the account, I suppose I have the login, don't I? But I mean, it's, yeah. uh, you know, being able to have people stick through uh, with us through thick and thin. I mean, it, that's something that we'll always have those experiences, you know, highs, lows, whatever it is. And Nick, as you kind of alluded to it in a very sappy finish of the show, I mean, I've gained a friend, you know, someone that I'm going to call a lifelong friend, someone that we can always talk shop together, always talk about hockey and we'll be in constant contact with and be able to talk. And maybe even in more, more so in that capacity, because we don't recap it every week. It's a little bit more, Hey, watching mm-hmm. this game. Can you, can you believe this? I can't believe this happened and stuff. And, you know, I'm looking forward to that next chapter. I think you and I, Nick, um, we're going to miss it, certainly. Uh, but at the same yep. time, we're also going to look forward to having that time to be able to devote to other things. It doesn't mean you won't see us around at Huskies Hockey occasionally. And for you, maybe even more so than than me, just by proximity and other opportunities. But I... Uh, you know, like I grew up a Gophers fan and you and I have both talked about, you know, you watched the Gophers too when, you know, you were younger as well. And we both full-blooded cardinal red and black we know who we cheer for any matchup any day of the week and i think that 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 passion project has turned into being a part of this fraternity and community that is lifelong huskies hockey and we couldn't thank our listeners and viewers enough and nick as you mentioned as you thank me i thank you as well too because none of this would have been possible without you and yeah bittersweet ending here for episode 207 but as we mentioned We'll have an announcement next week with more information and episode zero on the way. But as far as our recorded sh- recorded shows, we will not see you soon in the den next week. For Nick Maxson, I'm Noah Grant, the Huskies Warming House podcast, signing off. And your one-timer come in, they score! She scores! Dana Rasmussen for the Huskies alongside. Dwayne Kaprizov in for a chance to win it. He scores! Kirill the thrill is for real! Welcome to the NHL, a game winner. St. Cloud Cathedral is now 42.6 seconds away from wrapping up the school's first ever title.